Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are listening to this next edition of the Silmarillion Film Project. I am not Dave Kale, and that was not Dave Kale's usual introduction, because Dave Kale is not with us today. His his little hobbit is not feeling well today, so we may not see Dave today. This is Trish Lambert, co-host of the Silm Film Project, along with Corey Olson, the Tolkien professor. And we have two special guests with us today, Marie Prosser, who's our wonderful behind the scenes, keep, keeping us informed and uh, looking good on stage. Without <laughs> her, we would not look good on stage. And Nick Palazzo, who's been leading the script writing team. So guess what we're talking about today? Scripts, scripts, scripts. That's Gee, right. I wonder. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Excited to move forward. Uh, as I've said before, I really love these reviews and this chance to uh, not only <clears throat> go back and look at all the work that you guys have been doing on the scripts, but uh, or the script outlines, I should say, um, but uh, uh, but just being able to kind of review things, uh, which it's been months since we've talked about, and to be able to kind of, it's so easy to get lost in the details as you're like focused on the issues in every episode and to begin to to be able to see the overall arc I really love it so uh, I'm looking forward to uh, to moving forward a little bit here it is fun Hakan to be reminded of what we're done I totally agree so that's what we're going to do today and I'm excited to get back into it uh, first couple quick announcements um, uh, just uh, for those of you who haven't heard, um, we're doing uh, we're in the middle of our state certification process. Looking forward to beginning the accreditation application process. After that, uh, very exciting times for Signum University. We have submitted uh, our documents since last I talked with you guys. We have officially submitted. Uh, our paperwork to the state of New Hampshire, our 450-page document, and uh, it's uh, pretty awesome. That was a pretty awesome moment, actually. It ranks right up there with uh, uh, delivering my dissertation and my book manuscript, actually. Um, but it was uh, so it was very cool. So we've got that done, and we're we're now working our way through the process. And so there's still a lot to be done. Um, special thanks again, as uh, uh, as I have done before, for the. Um, uh, for the, the, the wonderful support that you guys have shown, especially uh, in the generosity that everyone has uh, demonstrated in helping us to pay our fees. We've already raised over $30,000 uh, to uh, support our credentialing efforts. So we have all the money that we need uh, for state certification fees, uh, and we're already a significant percentage of the way through what we'll need for the accreditation process. So. Um, Anyway, so that is absolutely fantastic. Uh, this is the link there. You can see there uh, should be still a link on the homepage, signumuniversity.org, to take you to this page uh, to uh, uh, get the whole story about seeking New Hampshire state certification, which is, again, such an exciting period uh, in the time of Signum University. Um, we do have our summer semester begins on Monday. We are coming up towards summer semester. If you've been thinking about uh, jumping into the program, if you've been thinking about maybe auditing a course, now is an awesome time to do that. Um, uh, so you can. there's still time for you to jump in, get in touch with us right away, and we can get you plugged into that. Um, and Myth Moot 5 is coming up soon. Uh, we, there is uh, more information about the schedule available, so you can see all the awesome things uh, that are going on. Um, go to signumuniversity.org, and you will see the link right there on the homepage for Myth Moot 5, uh, for our Myth Moot 5 event. Uh, this is our biggest gathering of the year. Uh, the regionals are just sort of setting up for this, right? The regional, uh, uh, the, the new regionals that we've been doing, which are super fun, are still only one day teaser conferences at the end of the day you know they're only uh, uh, you know one afternoon of, of great fun uh, myth moot on the other hand is four days uh, and it is absolutely fabulous so uh, if you can possibly come to myth moot 5 you absolutely should uh, it's really awesome it's in Virginia it's on the end of June uh, and the registration is open now again uh, links from the uh, homepage signumuniversity.org um, and we do have the announcement of our next regional event, uh, which is Bay Moot, Northern California. So uh, uh, August 18th uh, in Oakland, California is Bay Moot. Uh, and again, you can find registration information there if you want to register for Bay Moot. Uh, uh, that, all that information is available on our Bay Moot page, right? And so be prepared for uh, the proliferation of our regional moots this fall is going to be the real... the 
sort of the the real launch into the second phase of our regional moot program. We had our first few ex- expanded ones. We did London just last week. We did Texas in January. We did um, uh, we did the Midwest last fall, and now this coming academic year, we're going to be doing many more of them uh, as we continue to try to reach as many people as we can uh, uh, throughout the country and the world. So uh, I am really excited about uh, that. So, okay, those are our announcements for today. Now let us get to the script discussion. So, um, uh, Marie and Nick, uh, who are the, the, the heads of our script writing team, are uh, with us here again today. And I just want to hear from you guys. What are some things... I know you had mentioned last time that uh, episode three you felt was particularly challenging. Yes. The structure in particular mm-hmm. um, and the challenge of shifting the storyline from the Noldor to Valeriant in yes. the middle of the episode... Um, is an unusual choice for you guys to have made. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Uh, that is tricky. No question, that's tricky. Um, we don't one general reflection I was having as I was going through these next few episodes as a whole and kind of revisiting them. Uh, I was kind of reflecting... It's really difficult to do this stuff well. Like this, this part, this section, um, these next four episodes at least, episodes three, four, five, and six, are, I think, one of the most difficult kind of awkward segments of story we've had in the entire film film project so far. Um, in the sense that they're so... We're doing a lot of sort of gradual change, speed it up, right? Um, yes, yes we are. <laughs> and, and you know, development of, sto- you know, like the building of relationships from scratch, you know, so like the meetings of peoples for the first time and the technological advancement of societies and the building of fortifications and all these things. Um, it's, that's really hard to do. Harder, I think, as I say, than I think anything that we've done before, that, that, that we at least had, you know, the trip, you know, the journey in the first half of, of season two, uh, you know, the journey to the coast, in which, you know, so it was still a journey. They were going somewhere, and stuff was happening along the way, um, you know, and people were dropping off for various reasons, but it, st- it still had that overall thread of the journey, right? Um, and then, of course, we have the rise of unrest in Valinor in the second half of the season and the transition between them, that is, the comparatively long term of bliss in Valinor, we did very briefly, right? We just kind of suggested. And then they got to Valinor and were happy for a long time. And then this now interesting stuff begins to occur, right? Um, and as I recall, we handled that. We, we, we had a lot of time pass between two episodes, essentially, didn't we? Was it like around episode seven and eight last time, in season two? Yeah, yeah. There were a few episodes where uh, almost an entire generation would yeah. pass in yeah. between them. So, yeah, yeah. Whereas we're... here, we're a lot more real time, kind of, and it's going to appear to be real time, even though these are things that really couldn't happen in real time. Right. Exactly. We're cramming generations of things into real time, essentially. And that is very difficult. Um, You know, it kind of occurs to me, if not for our commitment to want to tell the whole Silmarillion story, this would be such a cuttable part, right? I mean, it would be, it would be really, uh, if we were to be do, if we were to be really ruthless in approaching season three, what we would do would just be focusing the whole time on the story of the Noldor, and then after they arrive, be like, and, oh, look, and there are Grey Elves there, and some stuff had happened to them, too, and we'd do, like, you know, the battle with the Green Elves and other, you know, major things and the establishment of the of the, of the the Girdle of Melian in flashback or something like that um, at the beginning of Season 4, because there's not enough in Season 4 anyway. Um, but, I mean, obviously, you know, we're not doing that, and I don't think we should do that. I think it's an interesting challenge to think about how to adapt 
the whole story as we're doing it and to really uh, have this build up through Beleriand as well and, and I, so I like the fact that we're doing all this stuff but we've not made it easy for ourselves I mean it's very difficult to, to do this yeah, is exactly the, th- this stuff would normally get cut for a reason in other words the, the other option would have been to restructure the timeline and find a way to keep Beleriand in season 2 after we went to Valinor mm-hmm. and show some of this mixed in with the Valinor storyline then, it would have been difficult as well, Very but that hard, was the yeah. other opportunity. Yeah, because there's oh, so we much... we didn't do it, and now it's too late. <laughs> Pretty much. Too many days. Yeah, yes. yes, exactly. Yeah, I love that. I love that, that poem. Um, uh, yeah, but I mean, and I don't think it... I mean, I, I still support that decision not to do that, because there was, mm. you know, that Valinor story, the story of the unrest of the Noldor, is so crucial and so consuming. I think that this stuff would have seemed even weirder to be interjecting. In some ways, I think that giving it this sort of full focus, you know, having our focus shifting to Beleriand and staying there for four or five episodes in a row is the best way to handle this, because this stuff is... Well, I don't know what to say. Not very dramatic. I mean, it's world building stuff, right? It's like, let's talk about their society and how it developed over time, right? And that makes a horrible kind of interjection into an otherwise really interesting, you know, developing. There is a really good dramatic arc there in Valinor, right? In the second half of season two. And if we'd been interrupting that with, meanwhile, uh, elves meet dwarves and kind of get along after a while. Anyway, back yeah. to Valinor. I mean, that, that, that would have been seriously weird, I think. Yeah, well, it, I mean, we did definitely have to find ways to make these things dramatic. We had to insert yeah. conflict into yeah. places just to make it interesting. Um, in this episode, it was especially difficult because we were shifting focus not only mid-season but mid-episode. So I, I did kind of do some research. I uh, looked for a successful show in which we insert characters which we haven't seen for about a season into a, the middle of an episode, um, leaving behind characters that we've been with for a while right. completely and not coming back to them in that same episode. Right. And I found no examples no of that examples. ever. <laughs> yeah. Well, so so here's <laughs> here's what I'm thinking. Yeah, I was I was I was waiting with bated breath to see what example you're going to come up with. Me too. No. I was like, yeah. ooh, ooh yeah, you this is going to be great. Yeah. No. Oh well. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. So, so when we went into this episode, my hopes were not high. Yeah. Well, yeah. But, you know, the other thing that some some shows will do will they'll do you know earlier on XYZ and then they they show you like they back you know they show you clips from backstories and I just think that's super cheesy I just think that's super cheesy you know it's like it's like as a way to try to remind the viewer of this character that was like right. you know four episodes or last season and or you're something like, and it's oh just, I guess this guy is going to be important this <laughs> exactly time. Yes. yeah I yes. mean it's just so cheesy I just ugh. Yeah. On the other hand, it would be almost necessary for a show like ours to do stuff like that when it's like, remember this thing for five Ex- seasons ago that Ex- was really important? Except that could take like half an episode just to do the flashback part. <laughs> Previously on the Silverillion film show for the past 30 years. That's right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Remember the sword that we built back in season five? <laughs> right, right. Neither do we. Uh, but anyway, that's yeah. right. That's right. Okay, so, well, so, Nick, here's 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 the awkward thing. The awkward thing is having insisted that you try to do this nearly impossible thing. I was reading the outline and thinking that I'm now disliking it for a completely different reason, like not for narrative structure reasons, but I'm worried about the storm. So we have episode three starting with the storm, right? Uh, Unin storm mm-hmm. that wrecks a bunch of the, the Feanorian ships. And my concern was... How are we going to convey the effect of that storm? Uh, so if we have the storm whip up, right? Like, so Unin is upset, and a storm rises, and the the ships are tossed, and the Feanorians are freaked out, because they don't know what to do. They're not sailors. Uh, and, um, and, 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 and we leave after the storm, 
right? Like, so the, you know, like we leave the Noldor ships being tossed around in the storm, or now Noldor ships. Um, <laughs> aren't we giving the impression that they've been destroyed? I mean, what is the viewer supposed to take out of that, right? Either they take out of it that, like, the ships have all been wrecked, in which case they're going to be awful surprised when the Feanorians are still around uh, later on, along with the bulk of the ships, or they're going to, it's going to really undermine the whole point of the storm. You know, like, if it's like, okay, so there's a really bad storm, and it's really dramatic, except it turns out later it wasn't actually all that big of a deal, and no named characters die, and everyone is still pretty much okay after it, right? Like, it doesn't have any cons... It doesn't lead to anything. The storm doesn't lead to anything. And mm -hmm. I... Uh, I mean, the effect of it in the narrative is that it is... It is the way in which the... What I like about the storm and how the storm, you know, Uenin's storm works in the book is that it, it conveys, like, you know, the the Valar and, and, and Maiar, but through them sort of is like the world itself weeping for the loss of the Teleri and, the you know, sort of showing that there are these consequences for doing stuff like this, right? That, uh, that you know, instant consequences that can't be avoided. Like, it has an impact. It does stuff. And... Uh, and um, and it has consequences, but, but I don't know how to show the consequences exactly. And I don't know. So I was I was having a, I was having a little crisis about the storm. What do you guys think about the storm in general? Should we cut the storm? If we cut the storm, then we could just cut the Noldor from this episode. It was the desire to have the storm. The storm was the was cause was the thing that was causing the trouble because we didn't want to cut the storm, um, and we didn't want to put it at the end of episode two because we had enough in episode two, and we wanted to end episode two with the Feanor Fingolfin stare down as they're sailing out of you know the as they're s sailing out of the harbor. That's an awesome moment to end episode two, um, but we didn't want to lose the storm, so we put it at the beginning of episode three, it would be simplest to cut the storm. It would be possible to make the storm into a final coda scene to episode two. It currently ends not necessarily just with the sailing out of the harbor, but also the grief of Finarfin. Right. At, at the, after the, so we see the elves grieving the kinslaying. So if we wanted a very short thing, we could see Uenin rise up and hit the ships at the very, very end of episode two, if you, if that was preferable to what we've done here in episode if, three. If we did that, that would diminish the um, the emotional impact of it even further if we did that with a short coda scene because it reduces the amount of panicked expressions we see and yeah. people sinking and yeah. dying. Um, so you, you're right that no named characters die so it invites the audience not to care. Um, not that the audience has to not care yeah. about nameless people, but we, they don't. Right. Um, that's 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 my concern. Is that especially? I don't want to say that we have to kill a you know a named character in order for a thing you know thing to have any impact at all. Um, but I think there's some truth to that. You know, if we just if we just off a bunch of red shirts, it's not gonna it's not going to have the same kind of impact. And like I said, I'm just, I'm concerned we're going to be sending confusing messages, right? I mean, I, I think that if I'm just putting myself into the position of a viewer, if the last thing I see before we leave the Noldor story thread behind for a while is, you know, a goddess of the sea rising up in wrath and grief and smiting the ships with the storm... I would think that as a viewer, I'm being invited to imagine that that's the prelude to her just wrecking the thing. You know, like I would, I would be leaving saying, "So, is, did she kill them all? Is that what happened there? Right? Um, is that what I'm supposed to take away? And then I'm not going to find out for you know another five episodes." Um, and that seems a that seems a that seems a mismatch kind of message to send. You know, uh, I. I would say I am 100% comfortable with cutting the Unin Storm out of this episode. We'd have to restructure it, obviously, but it it would bring a lot of peace to my heart to not have left this behind in this way. Right to not have to 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 just be able to start from the from the beginning of episode three with Beleriand. You mean? 
Um, yeah, there is a scene with the uh, Valar reacting yes. to the uh, to like that. I think we can find a place to put that, and it would be okay. Um, yes. It would be a little random, but it's not this weird like episode within an episode thing that makes me crazy. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. No, I agree. That would that would be fine. Um, uh, Zach is wondering if the storm could be brought up later in sort of a flashback when we return to the Noldor again. Um, uh, I could see that possibly working. The one, you, you know, the the thing that I would most uh, miss from the episode three outline that you guys made is the transition to Kierden. I love how you guys had, you know, we're transitioning from the storm to Kierden looking out over the sea, you know, with like a, a, a windy but not stormy sea. Uh, and, you know, that sort of sense of Kierden, you know, like sensing a disturbance in the force over there, right? But not really knowing what happened. Um, I really loved that transition. We could still do that. I mean, we could still start the episode that way. Um, It'd be a nice Easter egg for people who know. Right. They're like, oh, yeah, he can, he's sensing one in store over there. Right, right. For like the one in 5,000 people. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, on one level, I don't necessarily mind having a false threat to the Noldor storyline before we leave it. Mm -hmm. Um I know it's a little cheesy to do that, like, oh no, our main characters are in danger, and then you come back and, just kidding, everybody's fine. Actually, yeah, they're all good, yeah, yeah, right. Um, but, I mean, if you do have a cliffhanger of some sort, though, I do think the audience will absolutely hate the Valerian storyline, because it's just getting in the way of finding out what happened in the cliffhanger. Yes, especially since it's also not enormously action-packed, initially right um so yes we are leaving the like exciting cliffhanger for um you know dancing in a party you know it's it's it, yeah peaceful elves in the woods exactly so yeah, i think that that's going to be difficult um uh yeah yeah um yeah Okay, so let's let's cut the storm, or maybe we can we can kind of hint at it or vaguely allude to it. Um, you know, like I'm I'm thinking of even just something as simple as like a, a crack of thunder or something at the end of the at the end of episode two, um, and uh, and then maybe again the sound of distant thunder at the beginning of episode three with Kierden so that we know that like yeah you know, we're alluding to the fact that a storm has happened but we're not we're not really showing it um so if the real tolkien nerds are like what about who's in storm you can be like oh it's in there yeah, exactly it's totally there we didn't show it but it's it totally happened yeah yeah exactly w exactly would there be an opportunity to show it in flashback at some point we i mean we might uh maybe we'll sort of think about that as we continue going through the the episodes uh um just just remember that in doing a flashback you also lose any immediacy whatsoever so you know if you thought that it seemed under dramatized in real time <laughs> right Right, doing in flashback would agreed. Yeah, have no drama whatsoever. Yeah. Hey, remember that storm that we had? Yeah, it was pretty bad, but actually, it kind of ended up being okay. So why are we talking about it? Yeah. It, it, I think we did. We how about if we just included the extended edition for that season? You know. <laughs> so we're going to intentionally cut the scene when we're we stop. actually film yeah. a deleted sequence and right. say, I mean, it's got to be at least a few million dollars. To, yeah. to get that scene uh, filmed. Yep. That's it. That's oh, it, yeah. We'd make it up in sales of the extended edition for sure. Absolutely. We'd totally make it up in sales. Yeah, no questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I think, I, think that's, I, think that's, I think that's a really smart move right there. Uh, excellent. Okay. So, all right. So, with that, that makes things easier, yes? I know Nick that's going to make it problem happier. solved. Okay. All right. Now, the... Therefore, sort of the function of 
this episode in part. Of course, this is not only just like Meanwhile and Beleriand, don't you remember all these characters? And and we need to establish, you know, the new characters like Luthien especially. Um, but I think sort of thematically, we want to show, you know, this sort of land of peace, right? We want to, we want to have this like not quite... Eh, not literally Edenic, but um, you know this 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 sort of paradisical world uh, that the elves are living in. They really have no problems, um, and therefore I I like the emphasis on the, the sort of the 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 Stone Age technology of the elves, um, and how of course it's never been a like they've never had to have anything else like it's totally fine i also by the way one of the things that i think is a really really fun opportunity um for uh for us and a really fun opportunity for our 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 designers like our costume and uh prop designers is the opportunity which i can think of very few examples of when this has been done um but to make beautiful, graceful, elegant, and effective Stone Age technology stuff, right? Mm. Um, the elves have Stone Age technology, but it's not crude, right? Um, you know, Beleg's stone-tipped arrows, they're stone-tipped arrows, but they're not like crudely chipped flints, right? Yeah, not um, wholesome points. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that, that, and this is, that the association... Uh, the association in the modern mind between uh, primitive technology and crudeness is almost unbreakable, right? I mean, it's it's that's an almost completely inescapable connection. Um, and I'm I'm put in mind of a whole bunch of things that C.S. Lewis has said about this. You know, the sort of the assumptions that people make about primitive man and how uh, you know just because he chipped flints crudely doesn't mean that all of his art was necessarily crude. Um, uh, and he points out that, like, you know, the, the song and poetry of primitive man might have been in a very advanced state, for all we know. Um, but, of course, like, those things are not recorded and we have no, uh, no material evidence of them. Um, and so I think we actually do something kind of like that, right, with the music and, uh, and, and uh, Luthien's dance and everything. Um, but I think this opportunity to have technology, which is all on the, on the you know, the Stone Age level... But which is not uh, which is not ugly and it's not crude. I think that's really really interesting. Yeah, I think um, at Myth Moot Four, I brought up the uh, a lot of Polynesian technology because the Polynesians had Stone Age technology pretty much as long as anybody ever has. Right. Um, and you can see like there's a lot of graceful shapes. In a lot of their tools and weapons that you can see, mm-hmm. um, you know, using wooden weapons, you know, like yeah. wooden swords almost. Yeah. Um, you know, using the teeth of animals in ways that don't look ugly. Yeah. I think that, you know, they, that we could draw a lot of inspiration from stuff like that without getting too close to a real world analog. Right, right. Um, but yeah, I've, I, I, I find that from a design standpoint, conceptually, such a fascinating concept and something that I think is going to be really fun uh, to sort of depict. These are people who are, they haven't developed uh, uh, metallurgy because there's been no need. Why do they want it? They don't want it, right? There's no arms race. Yeah, exactly. Uh, in a land without war, you're not going to do that. And they have had no war they do hunt but their stone tools are perfectly sufficient for hunting and i love the way that this is um i really like how you guys use beleg's bow as a, a kind of a symbol of this right you have beleg's beleg's old hunting bow which was used for nothing other than hunting and and uh but is inadequate for war because uh, he's never had to build a war bow before right so beleg gets his uh, gets his strongbow uh, when a- after the orcs come and it's time for them to, uh, uh, to 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 defend themselves and take up arms against Morgoth who is attempting to destroy them. Um, I think that that you know th- that bow and the breaking of his bow, um, and his, you know his his first bow, uh, is uh, a really a really cool symbol. 
So I thought that that worked really well. We, we do broken weapons a lot in this show. Yeah, yeah, we do have a whole bunch of broken weapons. I was noticing that, uh, uh, that, that, that trend. Um, yeah, cool. Okay, so, um, so quick question then about, about episode three then. If we're cutting out the storm business, we do, as you were saying, we do, need, we do want to keep the, uh, the Council of the Valar thing. Would we want to use that as a transition at the beginning? Or would cause I think we'd need to, right? We wouldn't, or unless we want to use it as a transition between Kierden and, uh, and, you know, not Menegroth, but you know, the camp of the Sindar. Um, but I, I, I think, I, I think we, we, yeah, go ahead. Go, go ahead, good. Well, we could we could use it at the beginning and just kind of alter the dialogue a little bit so that it flows a little bit better directly into the Valerian plot. Right. Right. Yeah, my thought was if we're interrupting the Balerian plot, then it conveys the message that the the Valinor plot is still ongoing and, and creates a false expectation that we're continuing with it right now, which we're not. So probably better to... Um, yeah, I agree that uh, the, it, it would need to transition more directly into the into the Balerian stuff, um, which would be easy enough, right? Because we could have some of the, uh, some of the Valar pointing out... Um, as I think some should, like Orome, for instance, um, should, I think, express concern about what's going on in Middle-earth, right? Um, I mean, doesn't somebody... Ha- I mean, yes, they're upset about the Noldor, and they're talking about the Noldor, but doesn't somebody say, you know, I hate to say it, but Feanor's got kind of the right idea. Shouldn't we be getting ourselves over to, to the Great Lands and, and, and taking on Morgoth? We can't just let him go, right? And then somebody be like, well, you know... But the Noldor are getting what they deserve, and and have Orome be like, but what about the others, <laughs> right? You know, what about the Sindar? What about what about the Nandor? Uh, you know, do they deserve it? He's not gonna he's not gonna just fight the Noldor. Um, so some expression of, of of concern about what's going on in Beleriand uh, would be then I think a really cool transition into Kirdan looking out across the sea, and uh, uh, I would think that Olmo would have something to say about not forgetting them. And that would be a really good transition to Kyrdin, actually, yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Okay, cool. Yeah, that'll work. Yeah, yeah, that works. Um, uh, yeah, Tony uh, points out the fact that Aule could, men- could be concerned about his dwarves, or actually, Tony, I bet Aule would express some confidence Right, because remember when we meet the dwarves, they're already going to be fully armed, right? Uh, because they were like they were they made <laughs> they were made paranoid from day one by Aule, right? They were designed uh, with defense uh, against attack, uh, uh, you know, uh, in mind from the beginning. Um, so yeah, that's why I like they, that idea. Yeah, yeah, Aule is like. My people are ready, man. <laughs> I, I tend to have a lot of fun designing dwarvish fortifications. Yeah. Um, you know, like, I've been waiting for that because, like, I've been holding back, right? Like, in thinking <laughs> about fortifications, I've been holding back because you can't make it too advanced. You can't get there too quickly. Right. But, yeah. Yeah, but they they totally can. They can... They don't need an attack from outside to have first established their defenses. That's just in their DNA, right? Uh, to yeah. uh, to like be on. You can group. have like high Middle Ages level uh, fortification in dwarvish structures and stuff. So. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, no, that's cool. Um, yeah, good. Uh, other other things that you wanted to let me uh, go have a. Let's see. Where did it go? Oh, yeah, there it is. Episode three. So just kind of scan me. Oh, uh, the, uh, I thought the, the frame worked really well by, by actually just sort of like overall. Uh, I thought you guys did a great job with the frame. Um, I really, I really liked the way that the frame flowed and the, the parallels with the frame um, and the main action I thought worked really, were really strong in this set of episodes. Yeah, well, in, in this episode, we had to rely very, very heavily on it because it was the only through line that right. existed. Right. So I, I, we basically had to make this the the frame the focus in this episode. Yeah, and I think it, it makes sense um, in any case to to still ha- even without that 
uh, you know, even cutting out the storm and therefore making the Valinor segment easier uh, here in this uh, episode. It still makes sense just for the sake. I mean, this is the turning up point of the of the frame in a sense, right? Uh, I mean, the, what happens in the frame here? You know, the decision uh, of of Estelle to like continue on and to, to be traveling with Eladon and Elro here at all in the first place is um, kind of what makes the whole rest of the the frame story move right so the, there's there's more that needs to happen here than any other episode as I recall but uh, okay yep so uh, let's talk briefly about the meeting with the orcs um and oh oh no wait wait first I want to talk about investing Melkor investing his power in Middle Earth. Mm. Let's think about that. He should sing, is my main thought here, right? Melkor should sing, or at least hum. <laughs> Honestly. Yeah, no, I think he should sing. <laughs> <laughs> I think he should sing. A kazoo. He should I have a kazoo. He should have a kazoo. He pulls out an evil and sinister kazoo. <laughs> or... No, a boobazella. Boobazella. The bell rocks with the kazoo, you know, little kazoo band behind him. <laughs> yeah, oh, exactly. Nice. Yeah, no, he should He should sing. He should sing. We should have... And, and, and it's easy... Because we have his main theme from the Discord, right? I mean, you know, we have his primary theme. Um, uh, you know, this his loud, brash, repetitive theme, right? Um, Is and, it bad that when you said Discord, my first thought was like the, the game? <laughs> was the chat? software? Yes, exactly. Yeah, I know. Oh, I, I I I think of that connection often, actually. But um, <laughs> I I uh, I'm I'm just wondering, like, how many. Uh, I can't be the only one who wants to have a Discord channel, you know, called the Discord of Melkor, right? I mean, like, surely <laughs> you could make that happen, right? Uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, so, right. Um, yeah, oh, interesting. Mike uh, uh, Hoxtad suggests that maybe this is the last time that Morgoth sings. Like, we don't see him ever sing again. Whereas others, like Sauron, we're going to see, uh, you know, him sing at various points. Um, but we don't see, uh, you know, uh, uh, Morgoth sing anymore. Maybe. Um, but, yeah, I, there's no question that, you know, Melkor, you know, distributing his spirit throughout, like, the bones of Middle-earth is... Uh, hard to convey visually, you know. Um, but I think a a musical reprise of the music of the Ein- from the music of the Einor, which of course people may or may not remember by season three, but nevertheless, um, I mean, we will have recalled it still in uh, you know in 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 soundtrack themes to this point, so it'll still be familiar. Um. So. Uh, so yeah, uh, to have him to have him singing. I have placed a note in yeah. Yeah. the file. He should sing. He should sing. Okay. And we had the. Have we had the reveal? The bulldogs reveal. Did we get bulldogs reveal somewhere? Episode one. Episode I believe. one. Oh right, because that's when he came in and he 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 takes over the orc project, right? Yeah. Right. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah. All right. So that's I'm fine. One or more drow. Right. Right. Okay. Yes. Um, okay. Ooh, interesting. Mike has a great suggestion. He says visually, maybe that we the scene in which Melkor sings, uh, maybe it can be a kind of a preview or anticipation of the sunrise montage in the last episode, right? To see like darkness and shadow creeping over the world. Uh, as Melkor sings. That would okay. be really interesting, yeah. actually. Yeah. I like that. I really like that idea. Um, I mean, we, it can't be too cheesy. It can't be too direct. It can't be like we show him singing and then we show shots of, like, plants withering and, and uh, you know, like to, as if it's 
but but to show you know shadow and darkness and extreme cold and heat right um uh to show the world coming sort of increasingly under his his domination and his oppression uh in various ways and the effect on people um There's no way Melian wouldn't be aware of this, right? Thinking practically. Do we need a reaction shot in Doriath to Melkor singing? Hmm. I had only thought about having the orcs react to it, but yeah. the way you mentioned it, Melian needs to be aware at some point here. She does. And we, we did in our imaginary set for Menegroth, which we don't, which we're not at, so never mind that. But anyway, we could put a shot of her like standing on a hilltop somewhere, listening. And it, it's kind of almost like the um, the scene at Amon Hen. Amon Hen is that the one where where Frodo, where the seed is that yes. Frodo is able yes. to see. Yes. All the way. so it's kind of like that in a way. Only she doesn't need a special mystical seat for it. Yeah, if we if sh if the end of the mon so we show the montage of like you know the shadow rising around the world and um, we then and the last shot is her on a hill. We kind of leave the implication open that those things that we were just showing are in some sense perceived by her, mm -hmm. as if from Emon Hen. Yeah, I kind of like that. Um, so, <laughs> Hakon wants a Tom Bombadil cameo uh, uh, in the in the montage. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> Tom we, Bombadil we skipping down the line and missing a step, montage. you know. I think, yeah, yeah. Um, we did include him in the sunrise montage. In the sunrise montage, good. I, that's, yes. I think that's, that's probably a better place for Tom Bombadil. Um, if we include him in the darkness rising montage, then it might look like, uh, you know, he's going to have an immediate role in doing something about it, or he's going to respond to it in some way. Um, or that he's powerless to do anything about it, which I, I don't think is the move we want to be doing. Exactly. Yeah. It would be hard to avoid one of those two conclusions. I agree. Um, so um, now Zach is pointing out very sensibly uh, that how are we going to show the shadow rising when there isn't <laughs> much light to go around in the first place uh, uh, around in the world? Star, yeah. So we get, we get in some places we can just show this like black clouds moving over the stars, not quite uh, you know dawnless day kind of effect, but um, but you know again just show a place which was, you know, happy and starlit and, you know, then get shrouded in clouds. And, um, but I think also more important, because it's more than just darkness. Um, mm. I think it, it should be, we, we got the, the extremes, Cold. right? Yeah, we should get volcanoes mm. erupting. We should get, um, and could this also be, he's already raised Thangarodrum, right? Yes. Because that would be a sensible thing to have, coincide with this just saying could we maybe put off Thangarodrim until now he does the orcs in episode one and does Thangarodrim now he hasn't needed it right Thangarodrim mm -hmm. yeah uh, I, I, I think that just th thinking. that Thangarodrim is a need is a bit of a stretch I mean unless he, he needs it in order to suspend my throws from it <laughs> Um, <laughs> right, he does exactly. It's not. I it need doesn't really serve <laughs> much use as a as a fortification. Right. Um, but uh, right, I'm yeah. just saying we wouldn't <laughs> miss it if we didn't have it in episodes one and two, would we? I, I don't think we would. I I need to look. What we what we've used it for is to show the Balrogs are involved in Morgoth's ongoing project, and Sauron has been sidelined and Sauron is being oh, sent off to find spiders. So what we could do is use this sequence to show the barren land where the spiders live mm -hmm. and how it's, you know, more barren. <laughs> more barren, right. The Even more barrenness. barrenness. Yes, yes, yes. Um, Which showing... is very dry and brambles and things like that. Showing the, like, uh, awakening or, uh, like, uh, 
evil creatures of Morgoth that are still wandering the lands, like perking up and listening and becoming more active, would be a thing that would be that would also coincide with this, right? With his song, I mean. Um, so showing, you know, Sheila and her siblings, you know, crawling out and emerging and and uh, you know responding to the sound as the land around them withers, right? Um, could also be a thing that we could do to, to help to set up the spider plot. But again, it wouldn't just be about setting up the spider plot. It'd be part of a larger trend, right, of mm-hmm. evil creatures being aroused. We don't want to try to find too many things to go into this into this montage here. Just saying. Agreed. Um, yeah, no, we don't want to make I it 10 we, minutes long. We, we, we probably had, we probably got the maximum amount of stuff that we could fit in there. Yeah. No, I agree. I agree. Um, but but uh, it's still an improvement over showing someone sitting on a throne saying, and now I will invest my evil powers into the world. <laughs> right. And like lightning right. travels into the ground and that's that. Like this is at least showing something. Yes, yes. I mean, we yeah. we want to really demonstrate the cosmic effect because it's going to, I mean, certainly from the ground level, it's going to look like a, a, a cosmic effect uh, of this. Um, we, at least we should have things, and uh, Hakan and, and uh, uh, Tony are uh, were suggesting this too. We should leave have at least have Thangarodrim erupt when he sings. Mm-hmm. If it's mm-hmm. already, it, maybe it can already be there, but but there should be there should be an eruption. Um, and before he sings, can he establish? Can he introduce what he's doing in his song? by saying he can do a reprise of his speech at the beginning when he enters Arda. You know, I, 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 this, you know, I, this is my domain and I name it unto myself kind of, kind of thing. Um, to show that what he's doing is staking his claim on all of the world. Like, you know, I am the king of the world and, and, and I name it unto myself. And then he sings his song and then we, we show the impact of his, of his will being worked upon the entire world. I think that that, that works. And yes, Tony is also right. We do need to show the physical effects this has on Morgoth's person as well. Um, that he should actually, at the end of this, on the one hand, we show the effect of his song on the rest of the world so that we know that this song was effective, right? Um, but yet we show him actually looking weaker after this. And from this point on, he rarely does anything directly, right? He's just sitting around and giving orders pretty much from this time on, um, which is why I think it's really cool. It prevents the really cool opportunity, presents the really cool opportunity uh, to make it seem when Morgoth himself himself takes up a weapon and goes out to fight against Fingolfin, that's going to seem really weird. Like we will never have seen him outside actually doing anything other than sitting around and telling people what to do, right? Um, from this moment on, essentially. It depends what role we give him in The Awakening of Men. Oh. But that is a question for later. Yes. You are so right. Let's think about that next season. So, um, but yes, yes, you're right. That is the only other time when he might leave. Or the season after. One of those. <laughs> exactly. In some season <laughs> soon to be, uh, we will think about that at another time. Yep, I agree. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm assuming we would have to do this, the song, right, and the investment. This would have to come, uh, I mean, as you guys have it come well after the, the, so we have to have our paradise first, right, before he sings his song. Uh, yes. So we have the Doriath uh, uh, uh musical celebration uh, and everything. Um, yeah, okay. No, that all works. Um, everything's happy in Doriath and Luthien singing. Um, flowers springing up, I agree, uh, at her feet. That totally should happen. Um, and then uh, and then Melkor sings and Melian can say something ominous, but not extremely illuminating to Thingol afterwards, and then after that we get Beleg's meeting with the orcs. By the way, I don't think we need to invent an, uh, like the business about the deserters, I think that's kind of TMI. I think we can have some orcs just wandering about. You know, I, th- I think he would release some orcs just to wander about and do mischief. Um, I don't think we need a, a, a explanation of that. 
necessarily, but. Um, so it would be okay that they don't like have a commander or a mission. They're just yeah, roaming. They're just okay. destroying stuff. That's their job, right? That's what they were made to do. Okay. And that's to, just to sh- sort of show, I mean, in some ways, actually, I, I kind of like that even better because it's, um, this just shows sort of the f- spontaneous overflowing orc nature. Like this is the, this is the spirit that Morgoth distilled into them. Right. Um, this spirit of hatred okay. and, dis- and destruction. And so they're just, they're just, they're just doing them right. They're just, they're just being themselves. Um, and that's how they are when Beleg meets them. Um, yeah. Ooh, Mike is suggesting maybe we want a reaction shot from Manway to Melkor's song. It is going to be kind of hard to him. We have started this episode with the Valar. Are we not going to get a Valar reaction shot to Morgoth's song? Hmm. The only thing there is if we continue to, to go back to the Valar in here. Yeah. It is, like it, it, you brought it up earlier, that we don't want to kind of give the impression that they're they're going to act anytime soon on this. Right. Well, on the other hand, I I think if we have a scene at the very beginning in the opening, if we have one more brief glimpse of Manway now, like that's okay, I think. Well, especially since it's, they are going to do something, which is the sun and moon, right? Well, um, yes, yeah. but we're a ways away from that. We are, exactly. Uh, but Valor time. <laughs> Valor time, exactly. Uh, it's... It at least, it, it, my point is that showing the Valar responding to it is not necessarily a promissory note. We're not gonna, we're not gonna, you know, fill right. We're we're, we're gonna pay that note later. I mean, it, it's it's not gonna be immediate, um, and so you know we can't have them springing to action. But well, he, here's the here's the thing. Like, if you do it, if you if you interact with the Valar at the beginning of the episode. It's kind of just set up, right? It's set up for, you know, it's it's a transition there. If we put him in here again, if we put Manway in here again, then it's a yeah. plot line yeah. that has no resolution and it's basically yeah. just like a dangling thread. Yeah, no, I agree about the changing it from a transition to a, a line. Yeah. Okay, well, let's not let's have Melian be the kind of stand-in for now, because okay. honestly, Melian as stand-in for you know the divine powers in Middle Earth is kind of her job, actually. You know, she's like the. Uh, it's not like she has ambassadorial status or anything, but I mean, she is the link to the Valar in a sense, you know, to Valinor. Um, okay. So yeah, so let's do that because, but we can allude back to it in the sun and moon discussion, right? We can make it clear that the sun and moon discussion is explicitly a, and now we're responding to, you know, Melkor's, that thing that Melkor did, right? The song that he sang. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. Cool. All right. The... I like the, I said I like the orc thing and I like the jaws reference and I like the uh yeah, that was all good. Oh, Aeol. Um I like Aeol. Um I I don't overplay Aeol cuz as we went through the season I I was kind of feeling like sidelining Aeol more and more. And in particular, I don't want to do Nan Elmoth yet. Right. Uh, right. As we talked about later on. So. At yeah. this point, when we were creating this, they were still like Nan Elmoth was still on the table for this yeah. season. Yeah. Yeah. Um, here, here's the thing. Like. If it's weird that he's not involved with the dwarves, dwarves at the point, yeah. Um, during this season, like, so we kind of have to have some indication that that's going on. I mean, we could do it in flashback later, but as everybody knows, I hate flashback. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I agree. You, we, we, you definitely don't want to. It is super easy to overdo flashback. 
Um, I mean, I don't think it should always be avoided, but I, yeah. No, it's super I, I easy well, we're basically doing this whole story in flashback. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, but apart so, from like, that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's like, I just, as soon as you do nested flashbacks, I start to cringe a little bit. Um, which any flashback in the main story is essentially a nested flashback to start with. Yeah, kind of, but... Yeah, I mean, it, it could be done, and it could be done fine. I don't think that it, we, we would lose too much if we did his whole backstory and flashback here. Well, um, I think we just want to be... I don't want to set it up to make it look like Ale's going to be a really central character when he's not, essentially. Yeah. I mean, he, he he's going to be here, but he's still going to be pretty much on the periphery for this season. Yes. I mean, it, if we're willing to do, sorry, um, go ahead, Mary. Uh, I was I was just going to say what we need him for is his connection to the dwarves and his existence outside of Thingol's yes. realm. Yes. Right. Yeah. And now we can do if we did like a an ale centric um, episode where we do flashbacks um, to a story sometime in in episode four, some sometime around the time that he um, that he doesn't kidnap Arathel, um, I think that that would be okay. Yeah. I, we will need him when we get to Nan Elmoth, which I think will be next season, and then we need to have him establish Nan Elmoth, and we need to have Anglokel made, of course, as part of the Nan Elmoth thing, and we need um, to... And I like the... Th- the storyline that you guys were working on about him and the dwarves and his, um, you know, Telkar disowning him basically and being creeped out by Unglockel and, uh, you know, showing that uh, he's not creepy because he's friends with dwarves. Like he makes his dwarf friend. He's so creepy. He makes his dwarf friends uncomfortable. Right. Um, right. And using that, I think that's a really great way to introduce the whole, like uh, how sinister Anglachel is so that when Beleg is like, Oh, I want that one. You know, we want everybody to be like, no, Beleg, not that sword. You know, it, it, I think that's great. Um, so, well, if we want that, then it does kind of have to be done in this season. Yes. Um, yeah. And w- if we are doing that, we do need some setup that he has a relationship with the dwarves. And since we're about to meet the dwarves and he's not going to be in that episode, um, then this is kind of the only place to to like hint that that's coming. Right. The, the question here was whether or not we wanted to tease the introduction of the dwarves in any way before the episode in which we introduced the dwarves. So that was the point of this sequence was to be like, oh no, what's happening? Find out next time. Right, um, right. But if you don't think we need the teaser, we don't need it. I mean, it's fine. I don't think we do. I don't think we do. Um, especially if we have Aule already teasing them, essentially, uh, or you know, alluding to them okay. so that we kind of, yeah. they're on the radar screen already. Right. That that will serve the same purpose. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. cool. All right. Um, episode four. Look at us. Look at this Huzzah. swift celerity of our discussion. Wow. Okay. Uh, I'm impressed. Episode, this is pretty good, huh? So, okay. So we've got episode four, the cultural exchange, right? So we've got that. And, and I thought that, that first of all, um, can I just say that I love how that offhand comment of Aule and yet they shall have need of wood is like a light motif in these, in these like next three episodes. I thought that was really cool. I, I, I just, and I know we talked about it when we did the discussions before, but there's the way that that worked out. Um, as I was reading the outlines, it's like I kept hearing Aule's voice saying, and yet they will have need of wood, <laughs> right? Uh, mm-hmm. And I, I thought that was really great. Um, you know, how with no reference, no, with no overt reference to that passage, uh, that discussion between Yavanna and Aule is just like, you know, a, the dominant sub theme of this, of this whole section. I thought that was, I thought that was really awesome. Um, okay. What what were your 
sort of chief issues here? What what were the the main things that you were uh, uh, sort of curious ab- about? Uh, you know, reaction to or or uh, uh, most things you were struggling with in uh, episode four. So one thing we it didn't come up in our discussion, but it came up as people were kind of looking at what had been done. Um, is the introduction of the concept of language. Yes. All right, because we had to have some way for these guys to communicate. We couldn't have, and I was extremely concerned about sidetracking to go into this whole, like, learning language thing in order for them to communicate. Yes. So the only way that that we can i think that if i recall this had been discussed in the in the main session as well um was having one or more of the dwarves having had contact with the green elves over on the other side of the mountains and being and there being some communication that way the concern was that it makes nandoran look like it's the same language as sindarin uh rather than being a separate language that just has some similarities the issue with that, with finding a way to do that, is that English doesn't really have anything like that. No. Um, if you were doing this this show in a lot of other languages, you could find a language that was close enough to that language where they, they could kind of get what each other... Like, if you were doing this this show in Spanish, you could have them come in speaking Portuguese. Speaking Portuguese, and it that's exactly probably what I was be thinking. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. Um, English is weird in that essentially it's, as the good joke goes, it's three languages standing on top of each other in a trench coat. Yeah. And so there is no close analog to it. Um, the other option would be for Norn to actually be speaking Nandoran, which would be okay, except it doesn't sound anything like English, so why is Mablong able to understand any of what he's saying? Right. Well, I mean, essentially, the thing that I kept coming back to is the problem that we were confronting before we started season one right how how are we going to do the elf languages because of course the problem with nandor and sindar you know and the the you know the, so the the sindar language the nandor language is the same thing with the noldor language right um and of course that's gonna in the text that's made a huge deal of in right. fact of course it's the origin of uh, um well, of the whole approach. Yeah. And, you know, the the whole Quenya Sindarin thing, one of the reasons, is one of the reasons why I felt it was extremely important not to have the Sindar and Noldor make contact in this season, because I, if we're going to do it, that's the time to do it. If we're going to do the language differentiation, it's got to be when they make contact and we want to be able to take our time with that. We want to be able to spend time on it. And we will be able to do that in season four at the beginning of a season. To do that mid-season at the beginning of an episode and somehow squeeze that all. I don't think that there was time enough to unpack that in one episode. Yeah, no, it's not. It's really difficult. I mean, this is really challenging because the fact is we've had both the Noldor characters and the Sindar characters speaking English the whole time, you know. Right. Um, so to the viewers, they're speaking the same language. Um, right. And to to flip the switch and say at some point in the future, by the way, although it has appeared to you to be the same language this whole time, they've actually been speaking totally different languages the entire time is very difficult right. to do. And you can do that between seasons because you can kind of change the rules on people a little bit. People are more <laughs> right. willing to accept that. Right. Um, it would certainly be an easier way to try to change it. Mid-episode is not the time. I agree. Right. Um, the other issue was that if um, the Dwarvish interpreter is speaking Nandarin, unless the person, the viewer, is relatively familiar with like or at least linguistically astute in some way Mm -hmm. they may not realize that what he's speaking is a different language from the dwarvish language that they've all been that all of his buddies are speaking so as far as they know he's just speaking his language and mablong is somehow understanding right um which it's gonna look really weird so the only thing that we came up with was an extremely heavy accent maybe throwing some archaic um pronunciations for things and words i certainly think and i you know with all uh 
amply do apologies to you know Tolkien's philological curiosity which spawned all of these stories in the first place the difference between the language that the green elves speak and the language that the gray elves speak I think we can make it subtle enough to be done by as you say accent and and diction and vocabulary essentially we were hoping that whatever we had the dwarf translator speak in this episode would then reappear when the green elves come and screen in two more episodes so that when the green elves show up and they all speak with this funny accent it'll be like hey that was what that dwarf guy sounded like yes, yes. it was the hope yeah, um like and that. the problem with that is with Denethor being Lenway's son, and we already saw Lenway on camera speaking English to people like Beleg and Mablung, it seemed really hard to give Denethor a different language. But he's a different character and it's a different season, so I think we'll and get away with it. It's been a long time, yeah. right? Generations. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so that was our that was our hope is that we could kind of sneak it in with the green elves yeah. in that. Yeah, no, I like way. that. I like I, that. Yeah. No, that's great. That's great. Yeah, very good. So speaking of that dwarf translator character that we invented, um, <laughs> hopefully you like him. His name is Norn, and he appears in many more episodes this season. <laughs> I noticed that. I know. So I'm like, and now we have all of a sudden like the hero and spokesperson of the dwarves, who is the. Yeah. I, I developed a real liking for him over time, actually. Yeah, no, Norn <laughs> is great. I like Norn. Uh, I, I was, I mean, of course, my first thought was, but. You know, is that should we make him somebody else? That is, rather than just inventing a random character, is there? Uh, I mean, as as usual, right? We try to we try to have some kind of conservation of named characters. You know, if we have a role for somebody to play, like can we get a Tolkien named character in there? But of course, there are so few named dwarf characters, um, or even necessary, especially at this point in history. Exactly, yeah. yeah, or even necessary dwarf roles, right? Um, I think there's some more dwarf names in Lost Tales, right? Yeah, a few, but even there, if not we, all that many. Yeah. And if we, if you wanted one from Tolkien, we could dig one out. Um, I think there were some suggestions on the board. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm fine. It's, I don't have any objection to the name of Norn. I'm just, I would, but, but again, I, I can't think of, uh, I can't think of a, like even a, a dwarf who is unnamed or, you know, I, I guess it's some kind of societal role that needs to be played that we could have, a you know, that we could use this opportunity to introduce a character for. But we've got Telkar, the great smith, right? And and that's, I mean, that's an important role to have somebody representing sort of, you know, the pinnacle of dwarf smithcraft. Um, uh who is still essentially a journeyman at this point, a gifted journeyman, right? But a journeyman nonetheless, right? This is still, still, still her early work, yeah. Um, uh, the only other thing I could think of is, you know, we had talked about the possibility of having the, the, and I forget which was which. How did we decide on the dwarf cultures? Which was the? What do we have the broad beams doing? <laughs> So the broad beams are in Belagost, and they're the ones with weapons and everything. They're the weapons um, ones. And the yeah, architecture the, was the, the other? Um, I just was re Firebeards are in Nograd, and they have jewels. Jewels. Uh, right. Didn't somebody yeah, do I, architecture? Somebody ar was... Architecture, I think you guys wanted to associate with the long beards. Oh, most closely. that makes sense. Of course. Yes, yeah, the halls of, of Khazad-dum. Yeah, sure. Sure. Okay. All right, I knew there was an art. There were there were there was an architecture tribe. Uh, okay, right. Jewels. I mean, they all do all of these things to some degree, but some are more specialized than others. I, right. I would say. Right now, we do need. I, I have vague memories of this, but I've, I've forgotten almost all of it. Um, we did want to introduce, didn't we? Like a young jewel smith who's going to be the dude who eventually gets called to uh, to. Menegroth to put the Silmaril. Yeah. Your suggestion was to make Gamal Zirak be young Zirak first, and then Gamal Zirak for the yeah, final scene. That's right. That that's was right. that was your idea. I thought that yeah. was my idea. Okay, I have vague memories of that, but but we don't we don't want to we don't want to use. Okay, I, I'm just wanting to make sure there isn't a dwarf character that we're losing the opportunity to introduce and make some establish because because Norn. Yeah. 
Norn is is great for, uh, uh, for I mean he's the most sympathetic dwarf character of all of them uh, uh, so far really I mean he's the one that the viewers see most and have the most well, kind of commitment he does to. engage in a little bit of subterfuge a little bit later on um, if, I mean Telcar is also gonna gonna really be extremely helpful although that you could say is more of just general enjoyment of the craft rather than any particular desire to to you know, to help the elves um it's just you know she just really enjoys this kind of innovation um the thing that we have to be kind of careful with is that the dwarves are not immortal in right. the way that the elves are so we have right. to make sure that you know dwarves are kind of growing old and disappearing from the story <clears throat> Much probably much to the confusion of the elves, um, but we don't want to call that out too heavily because we want the elves to kind of have that experience when Bior the old dies, essentially. Right, right, right. So the the dwarves are going to try and kind of hide their lack of immortality from the elves in <laughs> right. this season. <laughs> right. um, We're not going to let on about the whole death thing. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, um, he doesn't so work here anymore. <laughs> he doesn't work here right. anymore. So, exactly. Yeah. He's moved on. So Norn is probably going to just quietly disappear from the story, and the elves won't know what happened to him. But the viewer will have to have some kind of hint that he has, you know, gotten sick and died of old age and can't travel anymore. <laughs> Essentially. Yeah. Um, but after the season. So that would be in a season four. Where is Norn? Um, well, here's his young son, who will be the new ambassador. Norn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Azagal, yeah. didn't you have a different beard color <laughs> the right. last time? I did? That's right. Hakan says, suddenly uh, there's, a, there's a new younger guy called Norn. The elves can't tell the difference. You know, they're like, oh, Norn, you've changed. <laughs> yeah. they, they all look the same. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And that was, I know you had wanted the... Um, the kings of the dwarves to be consistent yes. throughout the story. So we have Azagal here. We'll also have Azagal in the you know, yeah, the fifth season or whatever. But um, probably a different Azagal. <laughs> but could it be like Azagal one, Azagal two, Azagal three, where the the elves don't even realize it's a different Azagal? <laughs> yes. Is that a, is that an acceptable interpretation of your design? I love for it. A consistent character. That's awesome. Okay. And, and he can course, be played by the same actor. I don't mind. I just it dovetails really interesting with the whole Durin the Deathless thing, right? Like, yeah. is it really right. Durin? Is it you know? Is it, uh, well, yeah, Tolkien hints very heavily that that's kind of what the dwarves are doing. Yeah, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. That's kind of fun, actually. I really kind of like that. Um, um, yeah, I mean, we don't want to. We, we we don't want to play too much comedy on the uh, you know on on the elves cluelessness um but actually you know i think that a few subtle hints that elves don't really understand everything um and you know uh especially stuff that is totally outside their worldview like mortality um yeah. is uh, well, and you know this thing of of like during the death like doing the as got you know it, that is totally dwarfish that's not even like comedy you know that's totally yeah. something that dwarves would do yeah, yeah. Oh, it, it, and I think we have a, I think we have a scene somewhere where the dwarves realize the elves don't die of old age. Right. Yes. And like they kind of like, oh, and, like they've kind of suspected something this whole time. <laughs> right. But they finally <laughs> clue into it, and they're like, oh, we need to not talk about this with them ever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was Which, gonna yeah, be in... it's, it's also something totally dwarfish. I mean, that's just oh, yeah. so how they would be. Yeah, that that kind of knee jerk uh, uh, secretiveness, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. This is a non sequitur potentially, and you know, take us completely off the rails here. But are the dwarves aware of their history? Are they aware of the story of Owle? Do That's we know that in, yeah, in Tolkien's? Just, uh, yeah, he he says that they that Owley teaches them. That's right. And the if and that they yeah. revere him, if Azekal yeah. is one of the seven, you know, if, if right, he would know. He yeah, would remember that's true. It. Yeah. Uh, I'd be pissed if I was him. I'm like, well, what do you mean elves can live forever? <laughs> Wait a second. Oh man. He doesn't <laughs> personally remember, but. 
Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just wasn't. I couldn't remember uh, that. It, there's definitely a suggestion of a mythology surrounding Ale as their creator, and the yeah. source of the yes. Dwarvish language is supposed to be Ale. So, right. um, yeah, the elves just don't know any of that, so we don't hear much of it yeah. in the Silmarillion. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Well, I was thinking it from the point of view of the dwarves being, wait a second. So, wait a second. So, Ale created us first, right. you know, and we die? I mean, that would be like that would be a sticking point. I could see that being kind of the source of why dwarves don't like elves. <laughs> well, and also why they would conceal it, right? Because they would feel yes, like absolutely. It was, you know, yeah, a blemish in like the an work indicator of the maker. less than or something. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Or a weakness that they didn't want to reveal. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I could see right. really being a sore point. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Anyway, sorry. Yeah. I, I, cool. Yeah. So, I'll, I'll go be super quiet now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, good. All right. So uh, I, I'm, I'm looking to see if there's any others. Here's my let's see, here's, uh, episode four. I'm wanting to go through um, Mablung's role is really interesting. Uh, using Mablung as the um, uh, uh, thinking about Mablung as diplomat is really kind of interesting here. Um, and, and I love the parallel. I thought you guys did the parallel with the the orc and dwarf encounter really well um and i know we talked about that uh in the episodes before but i really loved how that came across how you had them uh, you know engaging in parallel activities and so it looks like we just have another troop of orcs here and then uh and then they talk i really like that um yeah uh so oh, Mablong, yeah. i kind of like the way that Mablong is kind of thrust into the position of diplomat because he, he that wasn't necessarily what he was out here to do right. obviously right. and somehow he winds up being the one who creates this relationship with them um yeah yeah um and i would think also that mablung would be one of the although he's not a natural diplomat he it's easy to see how the the dwarves might respect him more than i mean they're going to respect him more than they would I know that they really like Diron's runes, but it's not like Diron is their kind of guy necessarily, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas Mablung, I could see them just kind of respecting a little bit more. Um, uh, I was a little bit confused at first about the road making. You guys had them making roads, uh, making mm-hmm. a road specifically, and I was like, well they're making a road to nowhere like where are they making a road you don't start off making a road but you don't first you establish trade routes then you pave them right Uh. Um, but then i was like okay no wait it's a logging road right that's the point right so essentially the dwarves when whenever they go anywhere they essentially make a road (laughs) as they're going there (laughs) right they start paving is step one for the dwarves (laughs) (laughs) like we're not gonna pull these things over dirt are you insane they're Right, yeah. The the explorers of the dwarves go with wagons and wagons of paving stones, right? I, I, I love it. That's very dwarvish. That's good. That's good. Um, uh, but, but, yeah, I mean, it's having it, sort of showing how the dwarves are... This is not just like the dwarves coming and being like, hey, look, trees, how about we try cutting those down? This is like they're coming across an established lumber camp of the dwarves, right? So that this is... Um, mm-hmm. This is this is it, it. It shows that this is. I think it's it's interesting to give the dwarves a kind of a more in that sense sort of more proprietary stake in the forests there, right? Um, if the dwarves were just for the first time ever discovering these forests, then they would be more clearly, I think, in the wrong, or at least their position would be more difficult. To maintain, yeah, um, they would be they they would seem like the trespassers. Whereas here, it's going to seem you know if they're paving a road, it's going to seem like Mablung is the trespasser in their domain, right? It's clearly well, their, it's obviously their domain, right? And their their point of view, like when Mablung claims the land for Thingol, and the dwarves are looking around, going, "There is zero evidence that <laughs> right. you guys own <laughs> this place." Yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, like, that's obviously that's been used as an excuse for colonialism in the past. And maybe we shouldn't lean too heavily on it, but that's like, it's not 
entirely unreasonable for a random guy walks out of the woods and says, this is mine, and you don't necessarily take that right out of face value. Right. Right. And to be looking around and saying, well, what do you mean? This is yours. Yeah. The other thing I was thinking there, um, uh, that was one of the other points that I wanted to make about this episode. I think I think we want to be careful about the claiming of land, because I think in the pre Noldor, pre um, wars of Beleriand world, the whole concept of claiming dominion over the land should be different. Right. Thingol should Thingol should see himself as the caretaker. He should have responsibility for this land, right? Or you know, like that he is taking responsibility for this land. So he should see himself as the care. But he's not going to... I don't think there should be a, the sense of the whole concept of borders and, you know, sort of political zones shouldn't be, I think, in anybody's worldview at this point because they've never done that. They've never apportioned like this is where my mm-hmm. land ends and your land begins, right? That's never been a thing. This is the beginning of that, really. Um, so what's bothering them is not necessarily just the fact that the dwarves are there, but that they are they are seemingly exactly pro- um, you know yeah. deforesting just for the sake of doing it. Yeah, the issue to build is- this useless road that like clearly has no purpose yes yes or or uh is not worth its cost in the lives of the vegetation yes exactly um uh yeah yeah so that it's it's um what mablung would be claiming is not ownership but stewardship essentially over the land and would Mm. be so that they'd be having initially the same kind of so the discussion between the gray elves and the dwarves about the land would be very similar in kind to the green elves and the dwarves discussion about the land. It's just the green elves are much more militant about it because they are, um, they are much more biased in favor of the plants, right? They are the defenders of the trees with their friends, the ants, um, uh, to use Treebeard's language, the green elves, are entirely on the end side, right? <laughs> <laughs> they, right. They, and the and the gray elves are not right. Uh, the gray elves are not looking at things from a totally tree biased way. The green elves are right. The green elves are biased towards the trees as shamelessly as Treebeard is. Treebeard, um, and I love I love how you how you guys were confronting that. Like Treebeard will see no justification. Their need of wood is no excuse to Treebeard, right? Um, yeah. Uh, whereas yeah, like I, the gray elves at least get that. The gray elves get they, that. Yes, uh, exactly. Right. So, I mean, and, and I really like the way in which it looks like this is all coming Like, you know, so at first, their first, the first impression of the gray elves is that the dwarves are orcish. They're just destroying for the sake of destruction. And then the dwarves explain, and not only do the, uh, do, do the gray elves understand that the dwarves are, um, the dwarves are, are, are not doing it for no reason. They're not doing it for the sake of destruction. Uh, there, is, there is a purpose. There is a utility. But they also begin to see this is a utility that we could use. I mean, it's, it's useful for us, too. Right? We should, uh, you know, we could really take advantage of the, you know, technology that these dwarves use. We, we, you know, we, we need their help. Uh, and then the, gr- the green elves come in and are completely uncompromising. Right? Um, they don't understand. They don't care the utility um, utility is not an issue for them. And so we have the same issue, but now escalated in a totally different way. Um, so. Which was something we wanted to be careful with too, because it would be super easy to just have the same conflict twice uh, <laughs> in these cases. So we had to be very, very careful to, to nuance out the, the gray house position in this. Yeah, it is tricky, but it's 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 kind of nice to be able to establish the gray elves as this sort of ideological middle ground, right? Between mm-hmm. the dwarves who are much more utilitarian in their approach, they don't they don't particularly care about the trees as living things. Um, and I like how even you know even there, the way that they they get kind of won over by the idea of no, if you you know if you're a little bit more cautious and respectful in how you cut down the trees, 
it will actually help you to grow trees better and faster. So, you know, you'll have more wood at, at the end of the day if you do it carefully and respectfully uh, than if you just do it without any regard for the lives of the trees. Um, I, I kind of like, like that, that, that strikes me as a very, like in the way that we're constructing this, a really good kind of gray elf position. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, moderate logging, it's seriously, like if you, if you're thoughtful, oh. and, and yes, exactly. And, 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 and we're doing planning and then the green elves come in and they're the uncompromising end of the, you know, like, no way, man. Like, I don't care. Like the, the killing trees is murder. Now, what do you have to say? <laughs> like that's, and, you know. Yeah. And I think Marie pointed out, if I recall correctly, that if you look at the map, if I'm, again, if I'm remembering correctly, there is a road that starts going towards Doriath and then abruptly stops in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and yes. so essentially we have explained how that happened. <laughs> That's really great. I like that. Yeah, the door forward, the, the door road to Sarnford is, uh, it stops right, the at the River Asgar. So. Yeah. The question is, why does it not continue into right Doria? Here, yes, it just peters out. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's cool. <laughs> so, so exactly, so, See, we're solving a map mystery at the same time. Mm -hmm. So, are we good on this one? Yeah, yeah. I think that was the uh, that was the last thing. Um, that business about the territory and the and the mm -hmm. political thing was the last thing that I wanted to yeah. emphasize there. You mean we're gonna do three episodes this week? Brace at least? yourself! Oh man! And Holy like we're, mackerel! I, 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 I told I you, I'm going for four or five. I need to put my belt on here. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so we have the discovery of Menegroth. Um, uh, here we have essentially the sort of the flowering of the partnership of the dwarves and the elves, right? Um, one concern, I, I, don't, I mean, I don't know if this is a huge concern or how big of a concern this is. It seemed a little one-sided. Um, you think? Yeah, <laughs> which, but, which is not a problem in one sense, because, of course, our story focuses on the elves and not the dwarves. So if we focus more on what the, how the elves benefit from this than how the dwarves benefit, that's understandable. But the problem with it is that we've depicted the dwarves as being really utilitarian. So if if they're the losers in this, if they're investing all of these resources in helping the elves and getting very little out of it, um, we're not really being true to their character. Right. So yeah. I think this that, was a point of much discussion. Yeah. Well, I think I think this could be solved relatively. Here's here's my here's my here's my suggestion. Here's how I think it could be solved relatively easily. Trade. Right. Um, the dwarves are into trade. They like trade. The elves never thought of trade like they don't care, like they're content with what they have and just living with what. And so they are now seeing the usefulness with getting metal and metal products and things uh, from the dwarves. Um, they're seeing the value of what the dwarves have to offer. The dwarves don't need to be told like they like trade. Now, we, I love how you guys worked in over the course of uh, of these this, uh, string of episodes, the things that we know that were told in the text that the dwarves really value, namely pearls and runes. Um, but of course, thinking more broadly, there are lots of things that they're um, there are lots of things that they're going to have or that they're going to value that are not just those two things, right? In, in that they can acquire in trade, um, there will yeah. be a bunch of things they don't have access to normally that the elves would totally take for granted. Right. Um, yeah, one once one issue that was brought up was that dwarves don't usually domesticate animals themselves. Right. And so if they're going to get any um, pack animals or anything like that, they probably have to get them from somebody else who has already domesticated them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that would be one thing the elves could offer to the dwarves would be a beast of burden. <laughs> yeah. Well, and like leathers and 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 uh, uh leathers and like lots of plant products it crops for crying out loud right i mean yeah. that mm -hmm. uh grain and stuff the 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 dwarves i mean i think there's plenty even fish and stuff you know from the sea yeah. in addition to, to 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 pearls um there would be i mean yeah they they, they still would definitely place a definite value on um 
pearls and runes. You know, those are those are the those are the big prizes. But um, here, here are some dried oysters. Each one comes with a prize. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's there's yeah, there's lots of potential. I think there's lots of potential for them to to have. And again, and, and I think the elves should be very naive about this. Like that that trading is a is a is a big thing among the dwarves like it's one of their it's one of the things that they love as a culture the elves are they don't they it's not that they take it for granted but they they're, they're just content to enjoy what they have um yeah. they never look at a you know a, a resource and think like how can i parlay this into something into something even better that i don't have like that's that is outside the right. elvish point of view but it's very much the dwarvish point of view um and so I, I would think that even the like Norn's visit to the elves in Doriath essentially could be explicitly him going to like scope out what they've got and what they can trade. Yeah. For. Yeah. Well, that was one of the issues is that they, they don't the elves don't have a lot of stuff that the dwarves are going to see as particularly bad. I mean, obviously food stuffs and, and organic goods and whatnot. That's it. Um, right. Yeah. And we, we had to be very careful that we're not just consistently buying off the dwarves with more pearls. <laughs> right. Um, exactly. Would you like even more pearls than before? Although right. to the like, dwarves, that's pearls true. are not a renewable resource, right? So they would right. and, be, have a demand. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, and in the book that works fine, but when you're doing different episodes, you kind of have to offer them something <laughs> new because yeah. more pearls sounds kind of uh, in tv sounds kind of like just the same thing yeah. like nothing yeah. you've given them nothing else yeah essentially yeah um and one thing it seems to me in reading the book itself it seems like the dwarves are kind of like grooming a trading partner they're like mm -hmm. cultivating a trading partner here yes yes in the book the dwarves get almost nothing for their trouble like they don't get gain a lot out of this relationship um yeah well, so at least, it seems to at least me like they're very little of it yeah yeah right it seems to me like one of their aims here is to like they've had dealings with the green elves the green elves are completely worthless to them like they're they're just not worth dealing with the gray elves at least they can work with these guys yes yes um yeah. So, um, yeah. And Chris Stevens was pointing out, I think that's right. We do have the the most active model that we have, of course, not from the Silmarillion, but from the Hobbit uh, with the dwarves of Erebor and Dale. Right. And, and Dale, how they yeah. just were happy to rely upon the men of Dale to provide them pretty much all of their food. Um, yeah. We can't go that far because obviously they have to have survived to this point, you know, yeah. uh, without them. Um, but nevertheless, to show how they are, they basically can see, hey, look, dude, if we can get these guys to ship us food on the regular, we can spend much more time, you know, smithing than we did before. That's awesome. Right. Um, Which is essentially where we landed for episode six with the Green Elves, like the kind of the token, um, the token thing that the Green Elves are giving the dwarves is food. Um, the real thing they're giving them is not having the Yemps wreck their stuff and kill them. <laughs> right, exactly. But that doesn't work as a as a <laughs> protagonist. Right, right. It's bargaining not, it's, chip. It's not a trade good per se. Oh. Yeah, yeah. No, exactly. Um, um, yeah. Now it's interesting in the in the older versions of this of the Silmarillion story, the dwarves were much more explicitly merchants. Indeed, at the very beginning, they were not smiths. They were like they were just merchants, and their smithcraft was inferior um, because all they really cared about was cutting a profit. Um, and we had them being as like the arms dealers to both sides in the war. And so they were profiteering on the whole war with Morgoth uh, from the beginning explicitly. Berengi. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, Yes, the the original dwarves were much more like the Ferengi than they were uh, than they were like uh, uh, Tolkien's later dwarves. Um, <laughs> yeah, Tony points out they're paying the Nandor protection money, basically. Uh, Essentially, <laughs> how that, yeah, yeah, it's how that fell down. Yeah, yeah. Anyhow, so um, uh, I think it's fine for us to show. And but again, I think the key thing is that we can show the. The, the sort of disconnection between their societies, right? By how, you know, Norn is coming to Doriath 
in order to scope out, you know, and as you say, to groom them as a trade partner, because he sees the potential in building a relationship with these much more reasonable and much less extreme and touchy uh, 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 group of elves out here on this side of the mountains. Um, and so he's, um, uh, he's, he's scoping things out when he's in Darth, but the, but the, the elves don't even realize because they, they just don't get it. Like they don't understand the whole trade partner thing. They're thinking in terms of like, these people could be friends of ours and, you know, our partners in our, in our, uh, task of, uh, you know, stewarding middle earth. Um, and the, and the dwarves are thinking, you know, of like trade agreements and stuff. And, and that's like very far from the minds of the elves. Um, uh, I'm kind of reminded it's not exactly like this, of course, um, but I'm, I'm kind of reminded of the, the, the sort of the disconnect in uh, uh, in in the Holy Grail film, you know, when uh, in the tale of Sir Lancelot, when uh, the guy is saying uh, uh, Camelot. Very good pig country, isn't it? And Lancelot's like, is it? You know, <laughs> uh, you know, the one who is thinking in completely mercantile and and uh, uh, and financial ways, and the other who is seeing the world entirely differently. Um, uh, now, Mike is asking, do they have songs? Mike, you mean the dwarves? Do the dwarves have songs? I think the dwarves should sing as they uh, make stuff. They work songs. They have shanties. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I mean, and and songs of power, even while they're while they're crafting things, mm -hmm. I think that can be OK. Um, mm -hmm. But that's when they should that's when they should sing. Um, and I would think now it's interesting because, of course, that's going to be the point of connection in general for the Noldor with the dwarves. Right. Um, and that's when the Noldor should get more respect for the dwarves. But. Um, Aeol will be the one who would have that kind of connection. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas most of the, like the, or the, the elves of Doriath aren't going to be particularly, um, aren't, aren't going to be particularly into the smith crafting songs. I mean, they, literally don't do smithcraft and making things is not the same does not have the same status in their society as yeah. as it does with the Noldor which is why when Kelborn is uh, is bringing back this terrible news the dwarves are basically like alright you guys are about to get annihilated right like this is not <laughs> this isn't even a question right. in Norn's mind like this is like you, you guys need to go you need to get out of here this isn't going to work and so this, you can see, again, putting yourself into Norn's point of view, putting yourself into the dwarvish mentality, this is like opportunity squared, right? A, we need to step in to help to preserve these trade partners because they're going to get obliterated, right? And if they get obliterated, there goes our trade partner. But at the same time, in addition to helping to protect our own interests in our trade partner, this also open, offer, opens up this golden trade opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. They need yeah. our metal goods, now, and so now this is my now, opportunity for the sales pitch. Not only do we create this buffer zone where you know we have these people who are totally willing to protect right. their borders from from this marauding army of orcs, and we don't have to deal with it in, to the same degree. But we can make a lot of money off of this as well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we you know we get them sold on metal goods, and now so we've created a market for all of our Smithcraft. Right? This is fantastic. Yeah, exactly. This is like a win-win-win situation uh, from the dwarvish yeah. point of view. Uh, so They're look at that. With see, the iPhone. see there, we, we've we've gone from. Uh, We've gone from the dwarves getting nothing out of this partnership to them making out like bandits in this partnership, actually, right? Well, this, at this point, I think we were pretty much okay. It wasn't until we got to the green elves that we were, we were like, uh, I don't know what else we can give the dwarves to make this okay. Right. Um, yeah, no, with the green elves, it's all about the cessation of hostilities. Like, you know, uh, right. How can we establish? Like, how do we keep them from fighting? Is really all, and that's and that's Thingol's issue, right? That's Mablung's issue, uh, trying to figure out how do we, because it puts them in a difficult situation, right? Because they, the Grey Elves, appreciate trade with the Dwarves, like they and they and they can see the need. They could, like the Orc Coast is coming, right? We need to be ready for this, and yet they also totally sympathize with the Green Elves 
reasoning for why, you know, that what kind of, uh, what kind of, um, what kind of rationale can they have, you know, how can they answer the question when the green elves look at them and say, so you're okay with them slaughtering the trees? This is fine to you, right? Mm. You know, it's a hard question to answer. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, so, okay, we have a question. Uh, uh, do the dwarves have no altruism? I wouldn't say none, but it's not their number one impulse. Um, yeah. Like Norn, Norn's altruism comes out at the beginning, where, he's, where his altru- version of altruism is, you guys need to leave. Like, this isn't going to work. Like, his, his first impulse there, because they haven't created this kind of, like, full-on Lend-Lease Act kind of relationship, is, you know, and, and Kelborn essentially has to convince him that they can be, that they can be helped. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, once, once Kelborn is convinced, Norn, that they can be helped, then the wheels start turning of how do we, you know, how do we turn a profit on this? Right. Whereas his first impulse is to, all right, you guys, are my, I, like, I like you guys. I don't want to see you guys all get murdered. You guys got to get out. Right. Right. Um, and yeah. And uh, Chris, yeah. the other thing I'd say about their altruism, um, I don't think the dwarves need to be motivated by altruism, but I think that we can see them making a moral choice. Um, I, I I mean, again, in Tolkien's older works, they were openly trading with both sides, right? They they mm-hmm. were simply profiteering from the war, and they were not good guys at all. Um, we can show them making a choice, right? I mean, I, I wouldn't be against some dwarf saying, you know, we could double our profits if we sold our smithcraft to the orcs too, right? Their stuff is kind of shabby. We could do way better than that. Um, and, uh, and for... Azakal or, or, or somebody to say, you know, no, no, we're not going to side with them. That's, uh, uh, you know, so that they they do sort of make a moral choice and choose to side with the good guys, even though they don't look like the winning side at the beginning, certainly, to them. Um, so in that sense, I think um, we can we can see them do. But I, but yeah, I, I, I don't think as far as their own mo- their own motivations should be absolutely shamelessly um, kind of profit oriented. That's how they think. Um, yeah, <laughs> now you got me thinking about the Ferengi, Nick. It's it's not exactly as shamelessly profit oriented as the Ferengi, you know, not the way in which we see. Uh, sort of Ferengi values being, you know, uh, like overtly reversed from uh, from our traditional values. Um, but sort of like that, I mean, they, they don't to them. There's there's nothing that needs justifying. You know, there's no question of. But is it OK? You know, shouldn't we be giving generously instead of, you know, just seeking to trade with them? That's just not how they think. I don't think there's any harm in introducing the pragmatism of the dwarves. Yes. Because that doesn't necessarily come across as um, dishonest or self-seeking the way the Ferengi are. Right. Um, right. So simply having them interested in, well, what do we get out of this? If that's all they ever said, yeah, it would look a little yeah. cheap. But yeah. it's not. It's just it's a motivation for them. It's not the only motivation. Norn has at least established an actual friendship with the elves he's interacting with and is sincerely concerned for their well-being. Yes. And Telkar, when she shows up, is the same way of trying to give them the best chances in the, you know, so it's, I don't think we're portraying them as a mercenary in this situation. Right. Right. As, as they're not just using the elves, they're genuinely forming an alliance with the elves for, you know, and they're doing it for pragmatic reasons. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, I agree that, you know, this is not a, um, this is not an exploitation begins in the home kind of moral culture. Uh, yes, yes. Um, one of the rules of acquisition, of course, that's my favorite rule of acquisition, actually. Um, uh, from the Ferengi. Uh, another question about this episode. Aeol. Um, do we want to introduce right. Ale anywhere through here? Um, 
Well, we, we have him in episode four um, because we need to have the dwarves' perspective on meeting with the elves. Mm -hmm. So we needed to have an elf on screen that, that got talked to about that. And so we had Telkar and Ael discuss whether or not the king of Nograd would meet with Thingol. And the answer was no way. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So... We wanted to keep the focus of the episode a little bit closer to home, um, just because we have quite a few irons in the fire in this yeah, one. Yeah, we do. I'm just thinking, if we want to set up... Okay, one radical solution would just be to leave Aeol entirely out of Season 3. Or, let me put that question a different way. What are the reasons to keep Aeol in Season 3? If we're not doing that in Elmoth until season four could we wait to introduce his character at all until season four now the idea of having him be involved in the early days with the dwarves is the reason to have him right yes to show that he is of all of the elves the one who has uh is working most closely with the dwarves has has most uh adopted this sort of friendship and, and, and working together with the dwarves. Um, but we could, we could convey that, uh, uh, that superlative without having him be first, right? He could be the greatest friend of the dwarves without being the first friend of the dwarves necessarily. Well, that's kind of the, you know, what I was saying uh, earlier about having an AO focus episode sometime in season four. Yeah. Uh, where we kind of flash back through his relationship with the dwarves and we do all that. Like, that can be done. Um, yeah. I mean, because my fear is that, because originally, as I recall, when we were first talking about the Aeol and the introduction of the dwarves, we were thinking of using him as the primary go between, right? Like, he was going to be the one who was going to be brokering the relationship between the Grey Elves. Uh, not that we were envisioning him in exactly the role that, that Mablung is playing here, but so Mablung's doing it differently, but Mablung is basically filling the role that we were, that we kind of had in mind for Ale. Um, right. The for, problem with Ale is he's such a loner and yeah. a misanthrope that it seemed odd to cast him in a role of bridging the gap between cultures. No, exactly. Right. Ale's like the crappiest no. diplomat ever, right? I mean, yeah. Not to mention, if he had been brokering that deal, you kind of get the feeling that it would have swung towards the dwarves a lot more heavily than it does. Yeah, yeah, because he doesn't even share the same viewpoint that most of the elves do. So he, he's, he's, yeah, no, he's a bad spokesperson in lots of ways. I agree with that. Um, but my point is... Do we need him at all? Do we need him at all? Yeah, right. If he's not going to play that role, do we need him at all? And... The only scene that I'm nervous about in about doing in flashback is the the scene between him and Telkar, where Telkar doesn't approve of the of the black sword um, in the battle between the the dwarves and the orcs. Now, could you do that scene as just El showing off his latest his latest work? Does Telkar and Telkar expresses her disapproval? Yeah, you could. It doesn't. It it doesn't. Um, you're not showing why it's a problem in no. the same way as you do if you actually see Aeol in battle and there's some like questionable things that he does. Right. Um, but at the same time, it's actually almost cooler if Telkar, the great smith, can just hold the sword and feel it. Right. Just be like this. This this sword is mess like a, like you know a for efficacy you know like this is a really powerful sword, um, but this is seriously sketchy. Uh, yeah, I I agree with you. It's just that whether or not the viewers will will see, like it, it just seems like an informed evil in a way um, to use the TV tropes terminology there. You know, basically, we're telling the audience that this sword is evil instead of showing them why. 
Right. But the cool thing is that's always going to be the case. That is, it's never going to be... Unglock Hell is never going to do anything bad. Nor is it obviously... Well. It's not. I mean, no, bad things will be done with it, but as far as, like, what the sword itself does... Like, I'm thinking, so, for you instance... You can make that it wakes Turin up. Uh, the, de- the death of Beleg is the pretty deal. much... Yeah. Sure. Yeah, and it's... And the narrator blames that on the sword as much as anything. That Turin's hand gets cut because the sword went astray or something like that. But, well, see, but yes and no, that uh, when Gwyndor looks at the sword, he thinks the sword is mourning for Beleg. And the sword is still upset about Beleg. Um, the sword, what... Whether whether Unglockhell is to blame for the death of Be- of Beleg, Unglockhell itself blames Turin for the death of Beleg and still well, it holds would, it against it? him at the end. <laughs> right? Well, it would. It says that. Yeah, and Gwyndor <laughs> thinks that it's mourning for Beleg, its master. I I think that you can that you can make the case that the sword does deliberately try to create conflict between Beleg and Turin. Um, it's, I'm less certain that the that the sword is like, oh yeah, and now Beleg's dead. That's awesome. Maybe. Yeah. But anyway, my point is, all this stuff is really uncertain, right? Like, the one thing yeah. we know is that when that sword is being wielded by somebody, bad stuff happens. Right. And but that's it. We're not going to see the cause and effect. We're not going to see the effect that the sword has. It's not going to be like, um, you know, some kind of cheesy special effect. Right. Like when you wield this sword in battle, it is really powerful. But like, you know, veins of blackness work up your hand and it shows that yeah. like, you're being corrupted. It's not in some... soul caliber. Exactly. Yeah. It's not going to be like that. Um, so it's not venom. No, no. So it, I, I don't want to. I, I think we want to stay far away from any kind of overt cause and effect. Like, if you wield on Glockhell, this bad thing will happen to you, or it will, if it will change you in this X, Y, and Z. Like, it, j- so just to establish, and and even if we have to just establish that verbally, just to establish, like, badness is associated with this sword, man. Like, this sword is bad news. Um, then yeah. when Beleg takes the bad news sword we should have this sense of foreboding, which of course is borne out, right? And then Turin takes up the bad news sword and that <laughs> and, and, and yeah. foreboding will be borne out. And all of that stuff will happen without actually having to indicate any kind of, uh, any kind of direct sort of cause and effect at all. Yeah. I, I mean, I've been mostly okay with leaving Ale's storyline for later and doing some of this stuff in flashback. Um, the only other thing is the idea of seeing Ael in battle, which would be kind of yeah. Neat. It would be again. No, it's was... not something that's necessary, but yeah, I was thinking that too. Tony was mentioning that earlier on that it would be really cool to see Ael to establish Ael as something more than just a weird misanthrope. Uh, you know, Maria, to use your word there, um, he's 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 powerful. He's a big deal. Right. And if we can establish that by showing him in battle, I do kind of, I would like the opportunity to have Ale fighting probably alongside the dwarves, right. In the big battle Mm -hmm. in this season to show him, you know, being awesome, but it might not be worth the cost in the end. I mean, and and I, so I agree to you as, as, as Tony says, you know, ale falls, so he has to start high in order to have a fall. Um, I agree. You know, I wonder, Tony, if what we can. But here, maybe it's a different kind of fall. Of course, yeah, I mean, he does fall like totally literally, Tony, right? Um, but that's the thing. One of the other senses that I have in the Gondolin story, you know, the, you know, the Arathel story is when Aeol 
pursues Arathel and Maeglin to Gondolin. He's not an action hero, Aeol. You know, he's great. Yeah. But he doesn't have action hero greatness. And so when he pursues, when he gets on a horse and gallops after them, and when he pursues them and comes to Gondolin and, and talks big and everything, he's working outside his own idiom. You know, like yeah. this is, that's not... Um, and we don't want to get the feeling that... Uh, I forget who it is. Who's the, the son of Feanor that he makes contact with? Is it Corifin? That he uh, makes contact yeah. with? And Kel- yeah. We don't yeah. want to... Yeah. yeah, we don't want to kind of give the impression that they are under threat from him in any way. Um, yeah. So... Yeah, I mean, it, that was just, um, I think that that had been expressed during the session, the a- a idea of wanting to, to see him being cool in battle. I don't think that that's necessarily the direction we need to go with this character, and I'm okay not doing that. He, he's more like a wizard than he's like a, a, a warrior or a hero Yeah, in mm-hmm. that way. Uh, and, if we, and I think we could set him up in some sort of wizardly ways. I mean, he's like especially when he sets up a Nan Elmoth, he's like the little anti-Melian, right? Um, yes. Uh, and, and so that parallel between him and Melian is, I think, sort of potentially more interesting. And through his forging, not only of Anglachel, but Aaron Ruth, no, not Aaron Ruth, um, his own sword as well. That's the other sketch. Um, where does Aaron Ruth come from? Telkar? I don't remember. We don't know that. We don't know that. Could he forge Aaron Ruth? That is, uh, what, I'm, what I'm wanting. What I'm wanting is for to establish him as the greatest of the non Noldor craftsmen. He is. He is the. He is the Teleri Feanor. As hmm. far as craftsmanship is concerned, so that that's the, the basically that's the pinnacle I want to make him fall from. If he's going to fall. Um, and so I, that's why I'm thinking of Aaron Ruth. Uh, and I, if I'm correctly interpreting your grunt there, Marie, <laughs> you're, you're not liking that because you don't want the sword of Thingle to be touched by, to be, you know, bearing the spirit of Aeol. Um, right. Well, the whole idea of Beleg choosing the wrong sword, it seems odd that, Single would have already chosen chosen. the wrong sword. Yeah. Well, but so here's my thought. What if Aaron Ruth is one of his, because see, the making of Anglachel, and I, and this is where I especially like the idea of his, his break with Telkar, right? Um, Mm -hmm. If the forging of Aaron Ruth, that's the beginning of his fall, right? Um, So what if in his early works, he just, he's a really excellent Smith and he's making really great stuff and it's not sketchy, right? It's, it's um, where, but it's it's his desire to go past that, right? So Aaron Ruth is like one of the examples of his early work, like his excellent early work. But he wants to go past that. He wants more, right? And but why why would he give that sword to Thingol? He already feels super grudging about having given Anglicel to him to buy Nanelma. Ah, shoot, you're right. So I just yeah. I, I just feel like Thingol's sword should have a different origin happening. story. I, I tend to agree with that, but the, um, no, the only way right. to do it is if it happens first. I really like it. Yeah, exactly. I really like and, it. And exactly. Thingle really needs a sword this season because of the battle he's going to be in. Yeah, and if we're going to push Ao off to next season, we need to get him a sword. Yeah, that's true. Telkar should present him with the sword. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Fine. You're right. You're right. He has to get it, and he has to get it sooner, and Ao wouldn't get it. I hate it when Marie's right. Well, which, which is, is like all the time, always. right? Well, you, you must live a really frustrating <laughs> life then, Nick. If you know right. we, we, we talk quite a lot, so, you know, this happens quite often. Exactly. Usually if I find if I find Marie going, um, I'm like, okay, well, that idea's yeah. not going to happen. You're going to become an embittered old man pretty quickly if uh, if Marie being <laughs> right is is a problem. Uh, I'm usually very easygoing and accepting of people's ideas, unless they don't work. Uh, I get it. No, it's not your fault that you're always right, Marie. So, okay. Uh, no, 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 that's good. You're right. Um, so, fine. Okay. Yeah. No. Yeah. So, okay. So, Telkar can do our own Ruth. We don't have to do that. We can. Anyways, my my thought about the shape of Aeol's career still works. We'll just 
leave mm-hmm. and Ruth out of it. Um, yeah. But again, the, the point Certainly. that I was... he can start, he can start good and then get creepier and darker. The, the exactly. other issue there is if we wait until season four for this, he's going to have to get creepy and dark pretty fast mm-hmm. because we're going to need him to be already totally creepy by the time Arabelle meets That's, him. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the easiest way to do that though, is to have an episode that centers on him yeah. in yeah. the same mm-hmm. way that, with Formanos, like if we have time to do some stuff, stuff like that, um, yeah. hint, hint, hint. If we have time to do stuff like that, then it will make it much easier for us to have those kind of character changes happen more quickly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, also, just a reminder that we did introduce Aol in season two. He was at Cleveland. Yes. yes. So it's a question of reintroducing his character exactly. rather than exactly. Introducing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, and having him be there at Cleveland, and you know, to 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 suggest. His his antiquity is something that I think it will really help the sort of you know wizardly mystique of Aeol. Actually, mm-hmm. um, so I like that. Uh, yeah, good, good. And I, 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 by the way, that was something I was reflecting on at one point in a later episode. I think I really like the fact that we are um, we're beginning to build kind of organically that sense of how old the central elves are. Like you, you can already feel it, right? You can already feel the difference between those elves that were there at Quivienen, people like, uh, like Thingol and Celeborn and Círdan, um, and the elves that we haven't introduced until later, like Luthien is young and new, right? Uh, and a lot of the people of Doriath sort of seem young and new. I think we shouldn't introduce Dairon in season two and make sure that he's in that same generation. Um, and uh, we had Beleg yeah. and Mablong, I knew, but they were I know, but they were still very minor characters, and we didn't introduce yeah. them until the search in you know the search for Thingol, right? I don't think we showed them at right. Cleveland. Yes. Um, right. Yeah. So and and just think, I, I'm just kind of thinking about how awesome this is going to be, you know, like ten seasons down the road, like we, you know, many of them will die, but we'll still, you know, so Kieran in the shipwright is gonna is going to seem appropriately ancient by the time we get to yeah. the Lord of the Rings, right? It's really going to have that effect. Yeah, well, when we... I think it's in the next episode um, when we have Luthien and Círdan yeah. next to each other. Yeah. Like, that's exactly... You get that exact feeling yeah. that he is way older than she is. Yes. Um, and yes. that Melian... And then, immediately, like, almost immediately after that, we have a scene with Círdan and Melian... And she feels way older than him. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, you get that that sense of the difference in stature again. Yeah, no, that's great. I, I really like that. I really like that. Okay, so so we're agreeing to hold off on Aeol pretty much entirely. We're going to cut Aeol out of season three, save him for season four. I am totally um, okay with that. One question is, if we do that, is it okay to show dwarf-only scenes then with the, that forge that Telcar works at yes. um, with Okay. Yeah. So yeah. we can do the same scene just without Aeol in it. Yeah. And in some ways I almost actually like that better because we, we wouldn't want to, we want to make sure that the, you know, the, the Smithcraft of the dwarves really looks like it's 100% the Smithcraft of the dwarves. Right. Um, mm-hmm. We don't want to make it look like Aeol is part of the production line that's supplying the rest of the elves. Um, his own apprenticeship it's about him. It's not about everybody else. Right. Um, so, mm-hmm. you know, his like private tutorials with the dwarves really seems actually even more appropriately introduced just in the context of, you know, that kind of AO episode that we were discussing last time. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's good. Okay, cool. All right. Excellent. Let's look at this episode six. Here it comes. I think this is all we'll have time for, but we'll do this one. Okay, so we get the greenhouse, and we've already talked. Uh, I'm glad we're getting to this because we already talked about a bunch of it. Um, uh, I love the scene where uh, Mablung is talking to the <clears throat> is talking to the dwarves, and then a dwarf gets shot by an elf arrow, and it's like a super awkward moment. And then, of course, it turns out it's a green elf and not uh, one of the Sindar I, I I really like that. That was really cool. Um, uh, what were your thoughts or issues here with uh, the Green Elves episode? Again, I know we've talked about some of this stuff. The idea of the conflict between the Ents and the Dwarves being fundamental and unresolvable yes. and 
totally based on their natures was something we felt we had to preserve in this episode. Definitely. There wasn't going to be any peace treaty between these two parties. Yes. 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 Um, and yeah, it's really difficult to navigate too. Again, it, this puts, it puts Thingol in a really awkward place. Um, because how can he compromise with either side? You know, um, especially, and the green elves in particular are the, they, they, they're the most uncompromised. The dwarves are willing to compromise. They've shown themselves willing to compromise, right? Um, the only thing that they can't compromise on is something which to them is not you know, like, what are we supposed to stop building stuff? Like, and yet we have need of wood. Like, what are we supposed to do about that? We have to, that we have yeah. to get wood from somewhere. That's, it's, you know, it's like, what do you want us to stop eating too? I mean, like, what can they do? They're right. from their perspective, they're actually trying to be reasonable, reasonable, and they have come to compromises and stuff. And then here come the green elves saying no compromise. Um, right. And this, this is going to play out later on in episode nine as well. Uh, not episode nine, episode 10, it's going to play out in as well. Um, yeah. The, uh, again, the, the difference between how the dwarves view the elves and how the elves view the dwarves is very important. Yes. Uh, because they're not just two parties that see the other as unreasonable. They're coming from two completely different cultures and the way they think about what is appropriate yes. is completely different. Yeah. Um, and the dwarves see the elves as pretty much unwashed savage, savages. Yes. That element I found really interesting, actually. I, I, I quite like that, especially from the point of view. It's really easy to, in reading the Silmarillion text, think, you know, like those passages about the unloveliness of the Nalgrim, right, um, can kind of give you that impression that the elves are just simply looking down on the dwarves, right? Like they're obviously lesser... Um, but to show it would that go both ways, yeah. it would go absolutely go both ways and would be wholly justified in a sense in both ways. Right. I mean, the, the dwarves are lesser, like literally they are these like funny, short, weird, ugly, hairy people, right. Who, um, who t- seem, and to the elves, the ignorance of the dwarves, like the clear cutting by the dwarves, it's just like, it's not just that that's kind of a horrible way to act. It's also like dumb, Right. Like mm-hmm. what kind yeah. of a what kind of an a, 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 you know a, 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 how stupid must you be to act like that again apart from how how uh, you know uh, uh, disrespectful of living creatures it is to act like that like we're just watching you you know uh, cut off the branch that you're sitting on here if this is your goal um, so they there's lots of reasons for them to look down the dwarves but as you guys say and I love how you do this it's yes they're gonna look at these stone age creatures and be like yeah look at these savages. They have got no civilization at all. What do they do? Just hang out in the trees and shoot stone arrowheads and, you know, beats, you know, beat sticks together. Like, yeah, they're, they're, they're completely, uh, completely uncultured. Um, so, of course it does beg the question, are the green elves eating raw meat? That just occurred to me. (laughs) You can burn things that aren't wood. Yeah, but you can, and you can burn dead wood. I mean, I would think they wouldn't necessarily yeah, yes. even be anti fire. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay. That's fair. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it just occurred to me. <laughs> although, yeah, no, you're right. And what, I'm thinking of Treebeard's line about the bad excuse of, of feeding their fires. Um, but then again, I'm also thinking about the Legolas's comment that the trees of Fangorn seem, seem glad of the flames, right? Um, mm hmm. And I doubt that Legolas is just totally misreading the trees, that they're really angry and he's and Legolas is deaf to it. Like, I, that's hard to imagine of Legolas. Right. So um, I think we can imagine that they could build fires, but they would have a, you know, they would have they would no more think of cutting off the branch of a tree to build a fire than they would think of, like, you know, cutting off the leg of an animal to build a fire with it. You know, I mean, it's mm-hmm. like. It would uh, or cutting off the the arm of their their friend to eat exactly right yeah I mean it's it's and, uh, and the yeah. green elves are going to be fairly vegetarian eventually so they don't really need to be cooking meat at all right 
Though, of course, vegetarianism is an interesting place to be when the plants are your best friends. Uh, you right. Think actually, I understand that. Yeah, if they're biased in favor of anybody, it would be the they'd be more meat eating and less plant eating, actually, right? Um, but um, uh, yeah, it would be difficult. No, yeah, uh, Katriana on the Twitch chat is pointing out that, uh, of course, like if you're not using living wood, how do you make bows? Mm. That's actually a very difficult question to answer. Uh, mm. <laughs> uh, um, horn. They could make them out of horn. Horn. They could make them out of horn. Mm-hmm. Horn. Ish. I mean, I, I realize there's some there's horn elements there. that composite both. Anyway, we we. I think that we're going to get severely bogged down if we get too deep into. Yeah. The uh, the making supposed. And it's funny. Three, uh, uh, Marielle and Mike both at the same time said, "Elf magic." <laughs> they just sort of waved yeah, their yeah, hands yeah. towards elf magic. Yeah. Or the or the tr- or the ants are able to like, okay, you need a bow. All right, cool. Like, so they just make this branch right, grow. Gift for this them wood. Purpose. Yeah. No, I was thinking that uh, that's that's the direction I was thinking of too. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it does seem rather hypocritical, doesn't it? It's tough. It's tough. I mean, again, you. Uh, it, there's an Infinity War spoiler that explains this, but I can't that, say it because it's an Infinity War spoiler. I, I, I haven't seen Infinity Wars yet, so don't. Uh, don't worry. No spoilers. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah. No, I. Um, yeah, it would be interesting. It would be interesting. I actually think. Um, I could easily imagine a green elf culture that that actually eats a higher proportion of meat than normal because mm-hmm. they are more comfortable killing animals than they are in even domesticating plants. Um, you know, they could be like fruititarian. You know, they could just eat the fruits that you know, fall off the trees, uh, conceivably, but it's hard to do that year round it really is. Yeah. Well, there's no seasons yet, so it's not a problem. <laughs> true, yet. True. True. Be. Not a problem yet. Yeah. Yeah. Let's not even get into the fruit and seeds issue that we, that we would have there with that. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Um, but anyway, but the point is that they'll have a very unique culture that is very centered on their unique viewpoint, whatever physical manifestation that has. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, exactly. Um, we're we're going to have to hire an anthropologist to figure this out. So. Yeah, yeah well. exactly, exactly. There, there'll be time to work out some of these details later on. Um, I like, by the way, the fact that um, the fact that you guys had the ants just basically putting themselves in timeout. <laughs> basically, they're like... Well, I'll tell you where that came from. <laughs> when this episode was created, we hadn't done episode nine yet, and we were thinking, all right, so the ants are not at the first battle, so how do we get them out of the way so they're not in the first battle? And so we created this situation. Then you told us the ants were, were going to be at the first battle, but we didn't change this because it still gave gave us yeah. more reason for them well, to not because we want the ants to time. to ha- to make a catastrophic entry into the last battle we don't we don't want right. them to do they arrive late yeah, yeah. We, yeah. We, we couldn't possibly have only one catastrophic entry in one battle right well the thing is is that if the ants are going to be involved it's either going to be catastrophic or it's going to squelch the entire thing but there's no way that an army of like the ar- army of orcs who's never encountered them before i mean if the ants are all there no, how is Denethor going <laughs> to yeah. die? I mean, like, yeah. you know, yeah. that's just not really No, we agree with that. Um, but yes, yeah, so we needed to get them off screen, and we didn't think that they would um, listen to anybody else, so it had to kind of be on them to do yeah. it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. Um, so, no, I, I, I do like that um, it does seem to me to fit with the fact like basically that Treebeard's response when cuz Treebeard is on the, on the one hand Treebeard is an extremist right in his view of the trees um and he is unwilling to compromise 
because, of course, to Treebeard and therefore to his green elf friends, the the cutting down of a tree is simply murder, you know? So like, it's like, I don't care what you're doing with the corpses afterwards and how useful that is to you. The murdering is not okay. Um, But at the same time, Treebeard is wise, right? Yeah. And And he's kind of aware of the fact that he's a bit of an extremist. too. Yes. Yes. And that this, and it's a problem, right? He's got, I mean, he has to be able to be smart enough to look at this whole three-way situation with the green elves, the gray elves, and the dwarves, and to realize, you know what, um, we're a problem here. <laughs> you know, like this, you know, he can't change who he is. He can't be like, I'm fine with you. But at the same time, he can look at Thingol and the other elves and see that they're what they're trying to do, and and to perceive that, you know, the elves are going to, I mean he might be saddened by it in a sense, because maybe he envisioned a world in which the elves would be altogether on his side. Right. And Mm. now he is seeing like, it's not going to, it's not going to work out that way. Right. Nobody apart from the ends, nobody is ever going to be able to be altogether on the side uh, of the, like, it's not the way, even the green elves. I don't know. I, I don't know if we can exactly convey this on screen, but he should even have the sense that like, even the green elves shouldn't, be all together on the side of the trees like right it's kind of unnatural in a way yeah yeah they need to be looking at the bigger picture um in order to defend middle earth in order to uh you know to to serve the purpose that iluvatar made them for they can't just be tree bigots you know pro tree bigots all the time um yeah. that's not a balanced view you know that you know you just that, that's not sustainable as a perspective on the whole right um and well i think treebeard also recognizes that the cinder are kin to the green elves and he wouldn't want to totally destroy that yes. relationship exactly either exactly yeah i mean he, he can see that you know continuing continuing to push things as they've begun can only lead to what is obviously undesirable Right, an obviously undesirable um, outcome, uh, and so decide. And and so, and, but 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 then again, he's he's not bendable either, right? So he can't decide. Be like, well, it's okay if you kill some of the trees, right? He can't do that. So what does he do? He leaves, right? Um, he takes himself out of the equation and encourages the green elves to to work with the gray elves. Um, um, you know, maybe he can. He won't condone what the dwarves are doing, but he'll tell the green elves before they go on walkabout um, that uh, uh, that he trusts the you know that the, the gray elves are are good people you know and uh, and and they should work with them and and you know that he he believes that their intentions are good um, you know even if he can't see eye to eye with them on the dwarf question. So we um, we moved. The question of is Círdan going to join Thingol in Menegroth up an episode here? Um, you guys had talked about it being in episode seven. Right. Uh, we moved it up a little bit. Um, we had a little bit of extra room here mm-hmm. in this episode, mm-hmm. and it gave us something for the folks at home to be doing. Right. Right. No, that makes good sense. I thought that that uh, worked really well. Um and I like the fact that it, it also leaves us more room to set up for Kierden getting ready to be attacked, right? Yeah, yeah. So and, well, and also it gives us more time with um, with Melian and Luthien, which we want to make sure that we were spending time with them and developing their characters and their characters in relationship to other characters besides Thingol. Right, right. Yes. Yes. No, that, that's good. I actually, I, I, I did like that. I did like the Luthien Kierden, uh, connection, um, as an example of that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's good. Um, I was, I was totally fine with that. Um, how are we having that? I, I, I as this discussion has demonstrated, um, I, in reading these through this episode, I was completely focused on the elf side, um, partially because the elves are two thirds of the triangle, right? Uh, the negotiating triangle here, um, and of course, being interested in the ants and how they're connected with that. But thinking about the dwarves for a second, what's the dwarves' point of view? What is that? Because I mean, do they 
they're kind of touchy, right? Do they, do they, does this sour their relationship with the gray elves at all? Do they feel like the gray elves have, um, I mean, it just even, I know you only depicted the one dwarf being killed, but that can't be the only incident, right? I mean, so. Yeah. yeah. Well, we did have the Ents attack the forge and destroy the entire forge. So right. that yeah, killed. So I about that. Yeah. So there's that. That there killed Gamelbrog, which is Telkar's master. Yes. Oh, see, I forgot about that. Yes. Right. So we right. kind of. Yeah, so we did kill a named dwarf character, even though it was a minor dwarf character that only had a name because we gave him one. Right. right. <laughs> and and we kind of had Norn essentially solve the problem. Like, the elves don't actually solve this. Right. Um, Norn is the one who comes up with a solution because they still, like, the Grey Elves are kind of in a weird, he appreciates the fact that the Grey Elves are kind of in a weird position here. Right. Um, and they know that they don't want to go to war with these people over this when there's other options available to them. Yeah. Um, so what we do is we show that the dwarves are kind of, they're kind of double dealing with the elves a little bit here, uh, because they realize that there, there's this point that they can't use honest negotiation to, to solve this problem. So we do show that they're willing to to use subterfuge with their trading partners even um, to, to get what they want. So right. basically this, this event puts them in a position where we, the audience know that we can't trust everything that the dwarves say to the elves. It also create they're going to be resentful, right? Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, there's, there's, there's no two ways about that. They're going to hold a grudge against the green elves. And they have to express that in some way such that the suspicions that they delayed their arrival at the battle on purpose because they wanted the orcs to destroy the green elves. Um, that needs to be plausible. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, I mean, this sets it up really, really well. You know, to have the dwarves come and be like, oh, we are so sorry that we didn't arrive in time to prevent the orcs from slaughtering the great percentage of these people that we hold a personal grudge against. Like, that looks really fishy. Um, yeah. And again, here's like, some stuff to, pr to pay for that loss. Yeah. Which <laughs> means nothing to the green elves. Right. You know, and like yeah. stuff that they don't even value. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh Sorry, I'm pausing for a second because I'm realizing, and yet Cyros becomes a fop. He gets overly civilized. Yeah. I think is how that goes. Like, yeah. he gets to Metagroth and he's like, wow, this is cushy. Right. I like yeah. this. Exactly. This is cool. Yeah. You know, like, it's like, um, so my, my wife and I went to uh, Disney World in the fall of 2016. Mm-hmm. And I've never really gone on vacations. I'm not a vacationing kind of person. It's always, to me, seemed like a, a bit of a waste. Right, right. But I'll tell you, coming back from that was so incredibly difficult <laughs> because, <laughs> like, oh, yeah, I have to work now, which That's I've done right. my entire life. <laughs> right, right, right. Yep, yeah, when you're unused to that, uh, to it's it's easy to have it kind of sweep you away. I agree yeah. uh, in kind of depicting Cyros that way. Um, yeah, and I'm just thinking about like the Wear Guild from the Dwarves and how yeah. that could because Cyros becomes our representative Green Elf after after this. Yeah, yeah. Well, w what we can show is kind of almost this like corrupting influence. Yes. Of the affluence of Menagroth. Yes. Yes. On him. Exactly. Exactly what I was thinking about. Um, but I, and I'm wondering if maybe even we see him kind of keeping most of the wear guild that the dwarves gave him. So he becomes he becomes a wealthy person because of the wear guild of the dwarves. Um, most he of the might guild. even, yeah, he might even personally keep all react of like guys. well react almost like he's going to uh, okay this, and then somebody else like a, another of his people is like. We can, you know, and like there's an immediate uproar, and he realizes that he's the only one who was totally okay with that for right. a second. Right, 
right. and doesn't say anything about it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, it could be one of the interesting sort of differences we can establish in him, uh, you know, that sort of moral questionable. We do that in episode moments. nine as well. Too, yeah. Yeah. I remember we did. We were talking about some of that the stuff. armor. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Anyway. Cool. Cool. Good stuff. All right. Very good. Well, I was thinking of trying to squeeze in episode seven, but you know what? I don't think I'm going to go there. Uh, we've, we've gone, we've done four episodes. That was pretty good. Uh, I think I'm, I'm going to be pushing my luck if I go too much further than that. Um, that any, gives us a two episode buffer. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Any, um, any uh, f- sort of final thoughts or reflections on any of the, the, either any of the particular episodes we've been talking about or any uh, of the larger issues that our discussion today has raised? Um, I did want to... Sorry, go ahead, Nick, first. No, you can can go as well. I was just going to bring up the frame, and um, I know you said you were okay with it in episode three where it kind of took on its own story, but just to, like, double check um, with episodes four, five, and six, the... Uh, rivalry between Hamilcar. Estelle and Hamilcar yeah. is that playing out acceptably, or did you have any commentary on that? Yeah. Um, okay. I just want to make sure. So let's let's think about this for a second. Um, let me let me get which which episode do I have back here? This is episode uh, four. Okay. Um, so this f- episode four is the arrival. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. And his first meeting with Hamilcar and then Hamilcar kind of disses him at the end. Right. Right. Um, and then he gets sort of re- rebuked by Elro here. Right. And realizes. Mm-hmm. And so Estelle has shown that his own perspective was kind of shallow and self-centered. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then episode five, so episode five, uh, what's the frame action? I'm forgetting. Oh, he's telling the tales. He, so he, so he, yes. Estelle is tale teller. Yes. Yes. To set up Menegroth. Um, brilliant way of introducing the, of doing time elapsing without doing time elapsing, right? To show the beginning of Menegroth and then to have Estelle tell a story about what Menegroth is going to grow into, right? Uh, that is a brilliant way of collapsing the establishment of Menegroth with the ultimate destiny of Menegroth into one single episode uh, without having to do any elapsing of time at all. I thought that was super cunning. We were aiming for super cunning. Yeah. That was the exact appellation that we were hoping for. <laughs> that, was, that was very good. That was very good. Um, the I'm a little bit less clear about the motive. Like, so Hamilcar, what's Hamilcar's deal exactly with Estelle here? He, he is spoiled upset. Boy? Yeah, yeah. He he doesn't like Estelle. And doesn't like that the older people in the village are all showing all this deference and respect to this kid who just showed up. Right. When he has no, like, he, there's no context for him. There's no reason for him to to be like, oh, I get it. He's supposed to be the king one day. And maybe they are over overly deferential to him. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You know, like, even even... Knowing the the situation, they're probably overly deferential to him. Um, so that just makes it worse. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I would think that Hamilcar's thing would just be, like, who is this kid? Like, who mm-hmm. is this soft, pampered kid who has not earned any respect at all, actually? Right. Um, right. And, and that's essentially how we're building some sort of sympathy for Hamilcar when he's when he dies is because he just didn't understand that it's not Estelle's fault. Estelle doesn't even know, like, right. you know, and if Estelle dies, it actually is a big deal. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, I don't know that I'd go with the nursemaid line, especially since in the previous episode we had it revealed that Hamilton was, was acting his... as nursemaid. So, <laughs> like, 
this kind of a pot and kettle situation in that particular, I, I, or rather to say, I don't think that's the insult he would choose under the circumstances, right? It, it could be one of his it, one of his friends that says that, and you could actually show him looking a little uncomfortable with it, but not willing to call his friend out on something that's, like, that's such a good zinger, though. <laughs> <laughs> I think what he would be criticizing him for is just that he's a geek, Right. Like, so he's yeah. like, OK, so because basically th- this moment. Right. I mean, and this is a fairly normal kind of childhood moment, like the the new kid whom you are inclined to look down upon has shown himself to be skilled at something that you're not. Right. So you make fun of him for that thing. Right. You exaggerate mm-hmm. that thing and you turn that thing into an object of ridicule rather than praise. Um, mm-hmm. And the thing itself is bookishness. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. um so I think that would have to be the spirit of the insult would be, you know, that like he's, he's, uh, you know, he knows all these stories, but he's, uh, yeah. Uh, Mario is suggesting that he could s- sort of sarcastic, semi sarcastically call him a lore master. Um, uh, mm. and, uh, but, but who of course, uh, um, is, uh, is a, you know, a, a, a teller, a, so, you know, somebody who is a teller of tales rather than a doer of deeds, right? And emphasizing how he hasn't mm-hmm. done anything. Um, but, uh, okay. He's, he's not a man of action, but a man of letters. Exactly. As right. Dora would say. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but you know, make make that sound, you know, um, wussy. Like an insult. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. It, it, it would probably never have occurred to me to insult someone by calling them a geek so that's actually a good idea <laughs> exactly exactly i know that's very alien to our culture isn't it uh yeah exactly exactly um uh okay so then in the in episode six we had the the uh the setting up of the dwarves i like the dwar the, or the dwarves the the dwarves the wolves the wolf parallel i like the wolves mm-hmm. um in the frame uh and with the with the wolf attack um now, the moment when Estelle is allowed into the discussion and Hamilcar isn't. Um, my question here is how does how does Estelle parse that? It it doesn't even occur to him. It just doesn't I even think. occur to him. Like it, it like El- he walks in with Eladan and El Rakir. Nobody questions it. He doesn't question it. He doesn't even notice that Hamilcar isn't there, um, which is part of the reason why it, it, why it's even more infuriating to Hamilcar. Right. Like he's just oblivious to the fact that he really shouldn't be here. Okay. The so only he reason why he's here is and doesn't his appreciate his privilege. Yes, he's not mm-hmm. checking his privilege. Is is exactly what, how I would d- describe that. Okay. Um, I guess the there were two issues that I had with this. One was um, that we have to be at least careful because it's going to be difficult to convey if we just have them talking and Estelle's there and Hamilcar isn't. Um, we need to do some work to establish that Hamilcar finds it a big deal and is burning with jealousy that Estelle was allowed in and he wasn't right. Um, yeah. And uh, whether we have to show Hamilcar be disallowed or sent out or something, um, you know, like maybe Hamilcar mm-hmm. is there with um, Halbered when uh, Elro here and, and uh, uh, Eladon and, and Estelle come in and he's sent away, but Estelle isn't um, well, something see that. Right. See, that is the kind of thing where that, I feel like it would be unavoidable for Estelle to realize that that's happening. And that's exactly the other issue that I'm having is I'm trying to figure out. um, Well, okay, that's not quite exactly the other reason. But, yeah, I I do see that problem. The other problem that I'm having is would he be shown privilege in that way? Um, Well, okay, the the way that we kind of worked out the scene is that the the, the other people who are going to be in the meeting are already inside the room. Okay. So El, Eladon and El were here, walk in, Estelle walks it walks in there with it with them, and nobody really questions it 
because of who he is and they just get started. Um, whereas Hamilcar is outside probably with other younger people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, and because Estelle doesn't really speak up in this meeting, it's like nobody, nobody really deals with him in any way. Yeah. It's, just, it's not that it's like they just didn't it, it, the El, Eladine and Elver here didn't think about it, um, you know, didn't realize that he shouldn't have been there. Right. Once he was in there, nobody was going to tell him to get out. Right. Well, I guess I guess that's that's the biggest problem that I'm having is why wouldn't they think of it? Um and I would think Halberd, especially, like his attitude towards Estelle would have to be like, where's my bubble wrap? Right. I mean, like, you know, I, I, I want to insulate him from everything. And so I would think that he would be like twice as eager to exclude Estelle from any discussion of anything dangerous than he would his own son. Um, I mean, I could see it happening as a kind of oversight, but but even that, even as an oversight, it seems to me a little bit strange, especially since we've been showing Eladon and Elro here wanting to protect Estelle from danger and not succeeding <laughs> in doing that. I, right? Um, I I guess the the I'm thinking about Hamilcar's disallowment from this meeting a little bit differently, in that it's not necessarily to protect him. But the fact that he like he's not going to have any valuable input in the strategy of how to deal with the wolves. So him being there and especially if he's a bit of a hothead, you know, and Halbaran knows this, it just seemed like it seems to me like the reason he's being disallowed is so that he doesn't start making a fool of himself accidentally. Um, it's the, and uh, I'm not, he's, he's a teenage kid, you know, I mean, I remember being allowed into conversations with adults as a, as a teenager and saying all kinds of stupid things. Right. But, but (laughs) sure. Me too. But the, (laughs) the, uh, the biggest issue though, is not just that he's going to be embarrassing at the meeting, but I mean, if the meeting is like, okay, so. What dangerous battle plans are we going to make? Let's make these together. And like, but mm-hmm. uh, some of you who have been here with are not going to. Obviously, you're not going to be involved. This is a totally theoretical discussion where you are concerned, right? I mean, if you're going to exclude mm-hmm. them, just exclude them, right? And he he would be he, his fear, uh, Halberd's fear, which is of course a perfectly uh, uh, justifiable fear in Hamilcar's case, would be that if he involved Hamilcar, it would be tantamount to inviting him along with him. It's really hard to draw the line if you have him involved in the planning discussion, which is why I, it's hard for me to imagine Halberd being like, Estelle, come in. Yeah. But by all means, you'd be a part of this, except, you know, because there is no way, I mean, he would want, um, I mean, I, I could easily see yeah. Halberd like tying Estelle to a tree to keep him out of this discussion. Yeah. That I could. But you're, yeah. You're, you're already a parent, so you're you're thinking about things that I, that didn't occur to me. Um, <laughs> but I still will in the near future. Um, <laughs> the day will come, Nick. The day will come. Yeah, soon. yeah. I, I imagine so. Like it's it's occurring to me that that's why we're seeing this a little bit different. <laughs> Probably <things>. so. <laughs> Probably so. Um, <laughs> So, from, I mean, from I a guess, story perspective, we need Estelle at the meeting because we need it to be on screen. Um, so, <laughs> you know, we could have the meeting be seen from a distance, and Estelle could be curious and wonder what's going. You know, uh, maybe he gets out of Eladon and Elro here before they go to the meeting. What it's generally about. Um, but, mm. but but they tell him that he is not allowed to come and he's standing there watching and Hamilcar is standing there watching. Um, he could, I don't know if we want to have another, um, another Sam character. Gamgee shows up at the council uninvited. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. Well, well I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about like the interaction between Estelle and Hamilcar. Do we want them to interact? um mm. here well he, well he, there's there's a couple of things um one if it's in a closed room it's really difficult for that to happen 
So we would have to move the location from the Prancing Pony, which was one of the reasons, one of the things we were trying to squeeze into this episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is fine. I'm just saying that that's something that would have to happen. Um, the other issue was that one of the reasons we were doing this was mm. to illustrate the deference that yeah. Hamilcar finds so galling. You know, it's not that Halbarad invited him in and given the the choice, like had Eladan and Elrahir asked him, should we bring Estelle? He probably would have said no. But the fact that he's already here, he doesn't want to embarrass him by calling him out and saying, no, you out, essentially. Right. What if what if Estelle gets something out of Eladan and Elrohir about what's going on? And he ends up, he and Hamilcar are both on the outside looking in at the meeting. And Estelle, Hamilcar doesn't know what it's about, but Estelle does, because he's gotten it out of Eladon and Elro here. Uh, and okay. so Hamilcar thinks that he's, you know, and, and he can kind of play it up because he's still stung by the insult from before. So he's like, you know, so Estelle's being like, I obviously know everything about what's going on. Oh, what? You don't? Oh, gosh. I guess you're not such a doer of deeds as you think you are, right? Um, <laughs> kind of thing, right? And then uh, and then Hamilcar is, you know, will basically kind of dare him back and be like, you know, you're not, what's well, not like you're actually, you know, you're standing out here too. It's not like you're part of this, you know, uh, if, if you were... Uh, you know, in the center of these councils, like you claim to be like, why are you not over there yourself? Why aren't you doing anything about it? Oh, you're probably just going to like, you know, tell another story about it or something. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, that, we could do something like that. That could work. That that would seem to me to be I mean, I, I, I get the privilege thing, but I think it would be we could do it with a perceived privilege as well as an act as in some ways would make more sense to me because again, I got to think the number one reality of Halberd's life has got to be preserving Estelle's life. I mean, especially since he's the only one who knows, right? Uh, so it is therefore incumbent upon him more even than it is on, on, on others in his, you know, in his group. Um, he would feel a very special duty to wa watch out for Estelle's safety. So agreed. Yeah. Okay, cool. Awesome. That's good. Uh, well, I like Oh, it. and there was one more question. Yeah. Um, Bellifern asked if you were really set on the name Hamilcar for Halberad's son. <laughs> she, she was hoping that you could use that name for a hobbit instead. <sighs> so I was wondering what your thoughts are. If, you, if you're really set, obviously it's already been decided, but throwing it out there. I, what hobbit, though? In uh, the frame of season four, probably. Okay. I would say, I, I mean, it, it is a Hobbit name, right? So, uh, so right. if there was a good reason to use it, um, I mean, I, I still, I like it. Um, you know, the whole Carthage reference and everything. I mean, Hamilcar sure. is fun. Uh, uh, Tony says Hamilcar was his idea and he wants to keep it. So here we go. <laughs> okay. Well, that's... That's why this is being raised in public and not like being that. changed in the script behind your back. <laughs> exactly, I get that. Um, I I would. It's true that if we gave the name to a Hobbit, then it we would get more of the comedy of the Hobbit name thing. You know, like the way that the Hobbits are often given these highly dramatic. You know, given the names of ancient conquerors and you know Arthurian heroes. Um, which is funny, right? Um, For the half a percent of people watching the show who would know who Hamilcar is. Exactly, exactly. Uh, just like the half a percent of people. Now, there's a, a significant percentage of people who would recognize the name Fortinbras, for instance. Um, fewer, you know, that would recognize the name Dodinas or something, you know, so, several of the obscure mm. Arthurian names that are given to hobbits in the hobbit genealogies. Um uh, I don't know who Dodonas is, but I'll look it up later. <laughs> yeah, it's it's an Arthurian name. Anyway, um, uh, so it, am I absolutely wedded to it? No, I kind of like it. Now I agree, Marielle. If we, you know, if we have it as a Hobbit and he gets the nickname Hammy, uh, you know, okay, well, we can call him Ham. Um, I would just. I wouldn't want Hamilcar is such a great name. Uh, mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to throw it away. Is all 
I don't want it to be used for like a Hobbit extra who gets nothing. I see. Right? So I this, see. It's, 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 it's a name I th- it does, that deserves the spotlight. And so I think this is a fine place for it. It seems to f- it kind of fits with Halberd. Hamilcar, son of Halberd, seems it works. Um, mm-hmm. uh, but if we can make better comic use of it at another time, that's okay. I would just insist upon it being receiving its full comedic value. At a later okay, time. so we will we could revisit it later if we wanted to, but for now we're sticking with Hamilcar as the name of Halberd's son. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let, let's do that. Okay. We can go back and retroactively change Halberd's son's name when the yeah. time comes that we want to use the word the name Hamilcar for for a current character. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, if, and now that we've got into your uh, your Twitch time, <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. So it is slightly past time for me to go so uh thanks everybody thank you so much uh for your work on this uh, not only of course during this week but uh in the months previous uh here marie and nick and to everyone else uh who has been has been participating in those discussions thank you guys for being with me today uh and for everyone else who is able to join us and uh, i look forward to uh, doing the second half of the season, like not the whole second half of the season, but I figure we got, I figure we can do the rest of the season in two more episodes because although yes. the episodes get weighty, they also get more recent. So, uh, you know, there's less to kind of review and rethink in some ways. Um, but anyway, thanks everybody for joining us. And I will say as always, thanks for listening and Godspeed. <laughs>